Today's episode of the Receivables is brought to you by StarCityGames.com, where from Monday, April 5th at 11 a.m. East Coast time through Monday, April 12th at 10.59 a.m. East Coast time, you can protect what you collect. That's right. Select Magic the Gathering supplies are up to 25% off this week. We're talking sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, binders, and the whole array of gaming supplies. You know where to go. That's StarCityGames.com slash sale, S-A-L-E. Browse the wares, save yourself 25% off, and more importantly, protect what you collect. Today's episode of the Resleaverables is also brought to you by Coalesce Apparel and Design, the number one store for Magic the Gathering inspired apparel. Now, if you do follow Coalesce on social media, at CoalesceAD on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, you know that on March 2nd, my birthday, Coalesce Apparel gave 35% off all day long to celebrate me turning 35 years old because yes, I am old. However, if you missed that sale, which was a one day thing only and you're listening to this uh, not on March 2nd, so you definitely missed it, uh, a couple of ways that you can still get a discount on your first order or any additional orders that you do place with the company. Number one, if you do head over to coalesceapparel.shop, first of all, you get to check out all the cool stuff that they're doing over there. Uh, But second, if you sign up for their newsletter, you're gonna get a gift code coupon uh, via email. Uh, it's just kind of an introduction and welcome and thanks for signing up for our newsletter so you can be kept up with new releases, flash sales, stuff like that. However, if newsletters are not your thing, uh, you can always just use, use uh, gift code SCG at checkout and save 10% off of your entire order every single time that you do place an order. So uh, whichever way you do want to save on awesome magic inspired apparel, the place to go is coalesceapparel.shop and the gift code to use is SCG. Coalesce Apparel and Design Nobody made what they wanted, so they made it themselves. Coming up next, a set with too many damn keywords to name them all in this intro. That's right, it's Future Sight. Let's go. All right, everybody, we are back here on the Receivables podcast. Cedric Phillips at Cedric A. Phillips on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I am your host, and I'm, of course, joined by a man who I'm sure has at least had one stone beer this evening. I believe it's Stone. Is that correct, Patrick? Stone is the name of Brewery. I have slogged my way through the 24-pack over time. Uh, Tonight, I have a couple Lagunitas IPAs. Very... Very easy to drink, especially in relation to stone. Just another area where we differ because IPAs are abhorrent. They are absolutely disgusting, and I don't know how anyone drinks them. It's a wide range, but also it's an acquired taste. I don't know. I like food and drink that's kind of on the bitter side. IPAs scratch that itch. Makes me, you know, the the, the beer that I can't abide by is sort of the bright yellow Hefeweizen and stuff. Everything else I, I, I like just fine. Uh, here's a fun story about IPAs that has nothing to do with magic or this podcast. I remember uh, I was briefly dating a girl, and our third date out, we decided to take like some, uh, some boat and go someplace. Mm-hmm. And uh, we both sat down, me, her, and a couple of her friends. And, you know, we ordered some drinks, and I ordered a, uh, I think like a Hef. Or some like light wheat beer, like a Hoe Garden, and she ordered an IPA, and she was like, "Do you like IPAs?" And I said, "No," and she's like, "Ooh, that's gonna be a problem." And yeah. I was like, well, "Why? Why? Why would that ever be a problem?" She's like, "Well, my entire family really likes IPAs. We're pretty passionate about them." I was like, "I don't think that has anything to do with me." We <laughs> did not continue dating much longer, Something- independent of the IPAs. That was a really strange interaction. But it's a red flag. Something that I do not miss about dating is uh, your partner or prospective partner framing a just difference in taste as like a problem. It's like, I don't know, we can order separate beers. Not that big of a deal. We'll we'll be totally fine. Mm -hmm. But that was, I remember that happening and her like going like, ooh, not good. I'm like, "How, how could that possibly matter? It doesn't. It, it's did. it's the word. It, did. Yeah, you can like buy variety packs. You know what I mean? They make, like even they make in the those. worst case scenario, you could just get like two sixes or whatever. 
good use of the term variety pack here because that's a great way to describe future sight we didn't even plan that this set is the variety pack of magic right here <laughs> we'll give you a little bit of everything in this set and you think i'm joking for those of you who have not ever had the pleasure of playing with future sight or analyzing the set well i did yesterday or at least my long enough for my allergies they they held up for me to go through the data sheet that nick miller sent me my god i don't think anyone knows what they're in store for do you have any initial thoughts brave is the first word that comes to mind mm -hmm. there were some brave takes here um there were some things that were just i don't know it's so easy in hindsight to say how could you ever think that would work but there are a couple mechanics most notably i'm just going to get this one out of the way right now fortification where it's like how i just don't know what you ever thought was going to happen here but i mean i don't have a problem with people taking swings i think they took too many swings with this set but you know if you want to take some swings and try to hit a couple home runs sure but i don't know if the number of swings they took here was I'll go with justifiable. It's almost not really a set. I don't mean that as a, like, criticism necessarily, although I'm sure we'll get into plenty, but more that there is no underlying structure that you associate with sets, either in terms of mechanics or in terms of, like, the flavor and tone of the world. A lot of Magic's early sets fail the mechanical cohesion part to varying degrees. The the very early ones have just a bunch of random cards. And some of the early sets do have a little bit of definition, but not by the standards of 2021. But the flavor's there. There's like a... a and maybe it's like not exactly Dominaria. Maybe it's a lot more non-linear in the storytelling compared to the way that it is now. But at least the flavor is there and is cohesive. Future Sight doesn't have that on top of a uh, aggressively, intentionally not cohesive uh, mechanical structure. So it really stands out, I think, in comparison to literally every other set in Magic's history in terms of how big of a deviation it is from the next most similar set to it. The other thing that stood out to me while I was analyzing this set, because this was at a time when I was my most competitive, it is unfathomable to me that this set, which is just, I don't know, it has like 30 keywords and mechanics, like some common, it's very high, that I could just know them all when I was 20, yeah, 21. And I'm just like, yeah, that's how Fate Seal works, that's how Delve works, that's how Fortify works. Like, just knowing all these keywords, I'm just like, yeah, I know all this stuff. Like, what? Yeah, looking back at it, it's like how much of my brain space was occupied remembering, like, what the Morphland did, <laughs> or whatever, or the yeah, Zoetic ca Zoeta Caverns. That's easy, of course. I know what that does. The three three flyer for five. That's also just randomly an enchantment. You know, like all that stuff that's just seeded through the file at all rarities. It's not like the commons and uncommons are sort of just normal commons and uncommons, and then the rares. You know, there's all these weird creative concepts. No, it goes down to every rarity level in this set. It is um, frankly ridiculous, but in a Fun way to review. We have talked about, are we going to do one podcast or two podcasts here? I'll be uh, pretty transparent about that. We're just going to do one podcast because uh, I feel like absolute garbaccio. Uh, during the Kaldheim Championship last week, my allergies started to flare up pretty badly. And that was seven days ago. And seven days later, we've had one good day in those seven. And it was actually a half day. And since then, let me tell you, being congested is just the worst thing in the world in combination with the eyes watering and everything else. It is just the number of times I've woken up in the middle of the night where it's just like, this is cool. I can barely breathe. Just it needs to stop. And I'm not the only one that's suffering through allergies right now. But this feels like this year feels like an anomaly where it's just like it's horrible for everyone right now. You had we had tentative plans to record on Thursday and then you had to tap out. Have, have, like, all the days besides that just been awful? They've been awful. Yeah. They've been absolutely awful. So today I woke up. Today It's Sunday. Right now we're recording at 9.23 uh, Pacific time in, uh, in Seattle. I woke up this morning at, like, 8 a.m. Felt pretty good. And I was like, I got to take advantage of this. So I just started banging out the articles for the day. 
and like, you know, getting everybody's articles assigned on WordPress, doing all this work for SCG. And I'm just like, okay, I'm going to finish up the, uh, I'm going to finish up the, the notes for future site. And I texted you in the early afternoon, late morning. And I was like, I'm good to record today. Then I finished like another article. And then I went to the store and while I was at the store, game over. My eyes were just like, we're all set for today. I'm like, well, you know, this is a horrible place to consider. This is a horrible place to say you're all set. Could we wait until I made it back home? So then I, I go to the car. I get the shirt in my car. And I just have it over half my face. And I'm walking around the store. I look like a moron. And now I have to drive my car basically blind for two blocks. And so I'm doing it with, like, one eye barely open. Which, yeah, completely unsafe. But, you know, we're just keeping it real here. Get home. And I'm like, okay, I'm taking a nap. Get in the bed. Uh, at like 3.30, just can't fall asleep because I can't breathe. And mm -hmm. I'm just sitting there until like 5.30, just going back and forth. I'm like, this nap would be really good. So then I move out onto the couch, congestion leaves, and then I sleep until like 8.30, and that's why I have two texts from you, and it's like, yo, are we recording? And I'm just like, ah, shit, I, yes, <laughs> yes. So, well, I wasn't really why I wasn't really trying to push that angle. It was just you oh, texting me earlier and said, you know, I think I'm up for it tonight, and I was just checking in. I didn't really have a whole lot of skin in the game, but, you know, it sounded like you well, were there, on the mend, so. There's nothing I hate more than canceling something. It is, like, infuriating, because I hate waste. I hate when people waste my time, and so, by, um, by association, I hate wasting other people's time. And so, canceling just drives me nuts. Like, if I had to cancel the gym, or a haircut, or anything, it's just, like, it just eats away at me. And I've had to cancel recording this one like three different times. I'm like, I'm not canceling again today. I'm just going to I'm just going to suffer through this. I'm going to get it done. And, you know, the allergies part is one is one type of suffering going through absorb fate seal and fortification is a different kind of suffering. So it was going to be tough either way. So I just said, fuck it, let's do it. Going through the future site file with your vision not at 100% is a trip, right? Because it's like, am I reading this correctly? Squint, 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 rub, rub, rub. Oh, yeah, that, that, that has negative power. Okay, cool. On to the next card. Yeah, how, how, <laughs> how, how, how sick am I? How sick right. am I when I'm looking at these cards? I really can't tell. Like, I'm pretty sure that's real, but I don't know. My eyes are really playing games with me right now. So let's go over the facts of the set here first, of course. Uh, we'll start the, this set, future site. It's a 42nd Magic Expansion. Released on May 4th, 2007. Uh, 180 cards in the set, 60 commons, 60 uncommons, and 60 rares. Mythic rares did not exist, like we've said on every episode of the receivable so far. This set was codenamed Pop of Snap, Snap Crackle Pop. Has 81 future shifted cards, 27 of each variety and each rarity. Uh, this set introduced Tribal and Planeswalker as card types on the card Tarmogoyf. There are no actual Planeswalker cards in the set, though. That actually comes in... Magic's next set, which I believe is Lorwyn. Um, we'll get to the events with Planner Chaos here as, in a second, but it's time to get to at least most people's favorite part of the show, where I ask you what you were doing at this time in your life, and more importantly, my favorite segment on the show, which is your Upper Deck story of the podcast. Last time out, they took the plants. Yeah. All right. Upper Deck story. Okay. In terms of my personal life in relation to the set, not a whole lot is going on. Tim Aiton is living with with me. I don't re he might have been working for Upper Deck, maybe not, I can't really remember. He might have been subcontracting as an editor to my then wife. I don't know. It's blurry. But I remember a lot of magic online drafts with the set. I remember also when the set released on Magic Online, thinking this Tarmogoyf card seems kind of sick to me. People are sleeping on it a little bit. So I log on. Bots are selling it for like two or three tickets. I'm like, I'm going to buy a playset. I just got a feeling about this one. And uh, so, you know, a little while later, it hits pretty hard. When it gets to like 25 tickets, and I'm like, sick, genius, sell them. And then two weeks later, there were like 90 tickets or whatever. So punted that one pretty bad. In terms of an Upper Deck story, so we were being audited uh, by, <laughs> by, the, by the IRS, and so it was all hands on deck. Got to go down to the warehouse, got to count everything. We need inventory of everything that we have. So we go down, and 
it's huge. The warehouse is is massive. It's also, I think, the place where they might have done some of the like, you know, the like baseball cards that have the jersey inside of them. Yeah, I think there was some amount of the jersey came in. Someone would break them down into small swatches, and then they were like turned into the cards or whatever. So a lot okay. goes on in the warehouse. It's massive. And then just like pick a row and go. Just open up any box, <laughs> count what what <laughs> count what's inside, and then uh, just write it down on a piece of paper to for this IRS audit. And so I'm going through this box of just like trash from Gen Con. It's just it's just shit we brought back from Gen Con. Like not the last Gen Con either. Like three or four Gen Cons ago. So I'm writing down like, you know, just like four uh like debris caked plastic bags that say versus system on them or whatever the hell is going on. So Dave Humphreys now who's like, you know, lead design it was you know set lead on Kaldheim and pretty senior person at wizards now he's on the floor and he's sifting through this like box of lanyards like there's just hundreds and hundreds of lanyards in this cardboard box or something like that but it's like humiliating and he's like pulling them apart because he's got to count them one by one and they're all tangled together right because it's just a box of trash and i go hey dave (laughs) <laughs> he goes yeah and I go what's your PhD in again and he goes <laughs> <laughs> he goes biology <laughs> and I go hey where'd you get your PhD from again and he goes MIT that that that's my that's my story of the day. It's just that was that was a go to of mine. I you know I didn't I didn't break out a whole lot, but at, towards the end, whenever they had um, Dave in particular do really humiliating work, I used to be like, "Hey man, where's your what's what was your PhD again? Where'd you get it from?" Because he's like a genius and extremely well educated and whatever, and just you know I'm glad he's like you know his skills are valued now, but there's a time where. Rupper deck was sort of abusive towards a person of that sort of credential. <laughs> just out here, just breaking out boxes, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, now that our uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit, this is always like a fun little game. It's like, hey, do you, do you guys are you guys cool with Channel Fireball? Yes, but I'm going to make a joke about Channel Fireball now. They've been doing box breaks. Yeah. Now there's some real box break material. Just a random upper deck box. Oh my god. Well, most of it is garbage. Uh or illegal. So they are fun to break. But the even it, better. It, it's not, you know, it's a I'll say this, it's a hard thing to price out. What's the value of a, you know, box break for a magic set? You have a sense of what the box costs. You upcharge a little bit cuz people like box breaks and it's someone's time and energy, blah blah blah. blah. An upper deck box in the warehouse, it's much closer to like the Storage Wars type of shows where it's just like you've got to pay a hundred bucks in the dark. Most of the time it's zero dollars in there. Every so often there's ten thousand dollars in there. But the only way that you can ever find out is by paying the money. Cool. So we got a new YouTube content coming out at Star City Games now. <laughs> SCG <laughs> UD box breaks. If we can find any of the boxes. Well, yeah, you gotta break into, you gotta be able to break into the warehouse too, which is a whole, you know, other can of whatever. Upper deck was so uh, that dope. Is lovely. Upper deck was so dope. I got, it's just, I'm thinking about this. You know, we're gonna do however many episodes of this. You know, let's say theoretically one for each magic set. Once we run out, we find some way to pivot this to something else. It's like dozens and dozens of stories. I really don't think I'm gonna struggle. I think I have like hundreds of good stories from my time there. It's really yeah, wild. See, that's that's wild that you have that many good stories. Because I'm thinking about I've worked at Star City. This is this will be year nine, mm-hmm. and I'm like, how many stories do I have to tell? Which is probably more than I think. But like, I've also worked at I've worked from home for eight of the years. I don't have that many stories from working in the office the year that I did. So it's like all of my stories have to be like road stories um, from doing the SCG tour coverage. And it's like, do I have like thirty road stories? I probably do. 
but I'm not positive. And it sounds like you just have an, like an untapped well of stories from working at, at Upper Deck. Well, there's t- a couple differences. One is Star City Games more or less functions. Not true that's of Upper true, Deck. That's, that's true. That's true. And Star City Games more or less abides by the law. Also not true also, of Upper Deck. Also, also true. <laughs> and so those differences are, it's like really fertile ground for storytelling. I will say the number of places as it's revealed over time, like businesses that just don't operate lawfully. It's insane. Oh yeah. Like just big business, like businesses of all sizes, big businesses, medium sized businesses, small businesses. It's just like, do you guys operate like within the law? Not even a little, we're just out here hoping no one's really paying attention, doing the best we can. And it's like, Okay. All right, I guess. And like the number of times where it's just like I, I listen to a lot of marketing podcasts and stuff like that. And like, uh, you know, uh, there's a podcast I listen to called the CMO podcast, which talks to uh, marketing uh, our officers and uh, higher ups and stuff. And it's just like the number of times where it's just like, yeah, we just didn't really have any idea what we were doing. We were just trying shit. It's just like, OK, OK. Can I, can I give you can I get I know we're trying to keep it to, to one per. Can I give you one other while we're on the topic of overt illegality? Can I give you one other upper deck story? You're going to give the people a second Upper Deck story? Well, you know what? Since we're not going to do two Future Side podcasts, okay, just this once. Okay. So, uh, to make baseball cards, you have to, or whatever, any sport, really, you have to ha- get two agreements. One is with Major League Baseball, and the other is with the Players Union. And normally, those two organizations are in lockstep with giving out the license. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, you know, uh, MLB wanted to go in a different direction or there's just like too much shit going on with Upper Deck, whatever. We secured the right from the, rights from the Players Union one year, but not MLB. So it's, uh, we talk, our lawyers are looking into it. What kind of baseball cards could we actually make? And it turns out the rules are basically... We can have a photograph of a player, that's fine, but any iconography from that's like officially licensed or officially part of Major League Baseball is no good. So you want to have a baseball card that has Derek Jeter wearing a suit and tie, hanging out at a restaurant, no problem. You want to have Derek Jeter in a Yankees uniform or standing in Yankee Stadium or any other officially licensed imagery, that's no good. All right, that sounds like it's hard to make baseball cards that way, right? So we're at the winter meeting, uh, you know, where or the winter like whatever end of the year festivity deal, and all the executives have like five minutes where they speak, and the person in charge of sports cards is like, "Listen, I know that there's a lot of concern about baseball; it's our bread and butter." Uh, and we know that the, there's some complications with the license this year, but we've come up with some really creative solutions for it. And I I bet everyone here is going to be really impressed. I can't talk about it very much right now. Just, you know, look out for it because I think you're going to be really impressed with what we decide to do. And you know what they did? They just put out regular baseball cards. I don't cards. know. I d- they just put out regular baseball no. cards and were no. instantly sued. Like within hours of the, <laughs> within within hours within hours of the cards being on the street, MLB had a cease and desist out, and then that was it. That was the solution. Was what are they gonna do? Sue us? <laughs> it's like yes, of course, of course they're gonna sue us. All right, that's my other. Just I think you're all I, I think about that meeting a lot where that executive was like, I think you're all gonna be really surprised that we have that we have in store to work around this. It's just like what are they gonna do? What are they possibly gonna do to us? Oh, it's like, okay, instantly sue us and make us burn all the product and then never work with us again. Okay, cool. That's what they could do, I guess. And the next time they call, our number will be blocked. Right. We'll never get to talk to them again. <laughs> That's what's gonna happen. I don't think so. Unbelievable. I don't think so. My favorite, so that's just, my favorite is when things like that happen and it's just like, hey, so I don't think that's a very good idea. And then people are just like, yeah, we're just going to do it anyway. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, 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 okay. All right, I guess. Just, I, you know, I, I did my best telling you not to do that. And now here we are. And then, you know, the, the events unfold. Um, a brief story that I have. 
just about kind of incompetence. Uh, in 2010, when I was uh, aim, uh, completely directionless, aimless, is that the word I want? Yeah. Yeah, aimless is good. Aimless, yeah. No, no idea what I'm doing, right? So restaurant gig becomes available uh, in the neighboring city here in Seattle. I got nothing. You know, I saw, I saw it on Craigslist, and I, I'd served in restaurants before. And I was like, all right, sure. You know, I could use some way to fill some time, whatever. This is before I started streaming and stuff. I remember the name of the restaurant. It was called Gobble. Okay. Thanksgiving-themed restaurant, which, <laughs> you know, like, at that point, I'm, I'm 86, 24? 24, yeah. Just moved to Seattle. I don't really have a, what I would say is a plan, really. And uh, so I can't really, like, be like, hey, I have a degree in restaurant management. This is a horrible concept because I just need a job serving. So I remember I go there, and they give me uh, orientation. I'm going to be a server. And, like, the place isn't done yet, which is fine. And then they're giving me the walkthrough, and they're like, okay, so, like, here's the dish area. You know, you're just going to, like, you're going to take the dish from the customer, and then you're going to clean, you're going to do their dishes, and then keep serving your tables. And I'm like, hang on. (laughs) Hang on. I'm going to do what now? And they're like, well, yeah, you serve the table and you also do the dishes of your tables. And I'm just like, you know that that, you know that that does not work, right? Like, just functionally. So what, does my table have dishes allocated to it? Like, I was like trying to explain to the owner that like, you need to hire dishwashers. They're, they're very critical to making the restaurant industry work. And this guy's like, nah, man, like we, we save money here. You guys serve the tables and do your own dishes and then run them through the dishwasher. And then we can just continue to use those. And I was like, all right, I'm out. Mm-hmm. So at that point, you know, it was time to try to find something else to do. Like maybe qualifying for Pro Tour San Diego, which I was unable to do. This is our first event with Future Sight as the newest set. My question for you is, were you qualified for this two-headed giant pro tour? Sort of. Uh, I was not. Ooh, that's an answer. <laughs> I was not qualified, but Sam Stein was qualified with the, the qualification for the two-headed giant pro tour was all messed up. Like there was, if you have X pro points, your teammate has Y and how the PTQ invites work were really weird. I don't exactly know the mechanics of it. Like, I don't remember the mechanics of it now, but I remember that it was bizarre. And there were some conditions under which you could pick someone up and some conditions where you couldn't, I believe Sam Stein was initially going to team with Matt Sperling. Matt had to drop out because of a work commitment. And then Sam picked me up. So I did play in that event. Briefly. Wow. Okay. Briefly. So it didn't go well. 2 0 the first draft, 0 2 the second draft, and we're just out. Is that just game over? If you got two losses, you're just gone? I think so. I don't. I, we okay. didn't play for very long. I know that much. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Uh, so this Pro Tour was a strange one. We've never seen another two headed giant Pro Tour before. I doubt we'll ever see another one again. I am always curious about if two headed giant is a format that's received with positivity or not i really don't know um because two-headed giant is not meant to be in my opinion spiky but when you have a two-headed giant event that spikes are evolved in it becomes like uber spiky and not particularly fun so like i played in like a couple two-headed giant ptqs but um i played in one with a uh, cleveland legend dan rodman oh yeah rodman Rodman Tog. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just he named every deck Rodman X instead yeah. of instead of a legend. Instead of just so I actually so I am the arbiter for deck names right now in Magic. Kind of mm-hmm. that's one where I would just let it slide. Like I would just like in in twenty twenty one I would just go like yeah Rodman Jun mid range would be fine. Yeah, I had it for him and no one else. I had a brief period of time back before you were in charge of things, but I was still writing for Star City games or whatever, that every single deck that I made was either called Rainmaker Red or the Stone Tablets because it was like 
I imagined myself as uh, whoever it is in the Bible. I don't know if it's Jesus or someone else, but like coming down with the information that you need to live a good life or whatever. That doesn't fly anymore. But there are still occasionally people I run into in tournaments who bring up either Rainmaker Red or the Stone Tablets as a naming convention. I will say that one day... <laughs> I don't know if... I remember the Rainmaker Red era, but I don't think I was working as editor for Star City at that point. No, you were not. That's, that, <laughs> that's, that's sad. That's sad. Uh, one day I'm going to have to have the conversation uh, on some audio... Um, like podcast type thing or something. So I'm not going to write this article about why we name deck names the way that we do, because like, that's been a thing that's been cropping up on Twitter recently, like via PV and via Ben Blyweiss and a couple other people. And it's literally driving me crazy. Okay. I propose. It is driving me crazy. I propose a thought experiment. Uh, for okay. People out there. Try playing a new game where <laughs> <laughs> the deck names are gibberish and see how like easy it is to find the information. Okay. If you really enjoy these deck names, now think about how much more magic you play or buy because the decks have these names. If the answer is zero and the answer is zero, I, you can lie to yourself and say it's some number above zero, but it is actually zero. And you can imagine being a new player in a game trying to navigate this like just unimaginable just inundation of information and trying to make any sense out of it hopefully you can come to the right answer you probably won't but everything no, most you, people don't everything you need is there to be able to draw the right answer it's it's the one thing right now that is driving me absolutely nuts mm -hmm. I, and i'm trying to think about why i mentioned this what tangent am I on? My brain doesn't work right now. Um, I don't know why I mentioned that, but okay, I got that off my chest. Um, Lockman and Van Lunen. Mm -hmm. I believe, if my research is correct, and Nick Miller's research is correct, this was both their first pro tour. Yep, Jersey they, kids. They won a P they, yeah, they won a PTQ, and then they found the strategy that no one else found, as best, as best to my knowledge, maybe I'm wrong, of which was forcing slivers, and uh, mo most importantly, virulent sliver broke the 2HG mold because you only had to deal 10 poison counters instead of dealing 40 damage, and that's game. And uh, they did this, and they pretty handily won this Pro Tour. So there, it's true, and it's not true. It's not like no one else had sliver decks. I tested a lot for that Pro Tour. Some amount of the time, we had a sliver deck. But they did take it to a... And they pushed the envelope on it more than any other team did, for sure. There's a difference between we're aware of slivers, and if we open up some of the marquee on commons, we're, you know, willing to dabble our toes into it or whatever, versus, like, no, this is what we are trying to do every single time. We're forcing it. So there is some amount of... I, I think the, like, they had a monopoly on the strategy no one knew about. That's a little overstated. It was out there. People knew about it, but it, how hard they drove on it um, was unique to them and uh, cool that they won a Pro Tour out of it. It seems like something like that in 2021 would never happen, which is just, oh yeah, we got a thing that you guys don't really have. And because of how information sharing happens now, and so we're going to win the event as a result. I, it's not impossible that that happens again. But I do think it's pretty great that, that it feels like that's what happened at that event. It's obviously happened at plenty of tournaments. Uh, but for them to really shove on slivers and basically be correct and win a Pro Tour because of it, it's pretty legendary stuff. I mean, it's really... Uh, so it's an interesting format for it to come up as well. Because if you imagine two-headed uh, two giant in most draft formats, you'd be like, okay, there's a handful of linear strategies like um you know tribal or snow or whatever and we're just going to do that time spiral stands out as a block where there isn't a whole lot of that going on the drafting of that format was a lot of just like good stuff or individual like two card synergies that you're trying to to dive into slivers stood out as being one of very few like linear strategies inside the block where it was mostly a good stuff draft format. So I think 
most draft formats would just sort of be like, yeah, you just fall into one of the linears. But Time Spiral was this weird soup of just like, here's a sea of random cards, go at it. And so, um, you know, it's a perfect storm for a lot of weird stuff happening. Okay, I remember why I mentioned Rodman Tog and Rainmaker Red <laughs> came up. <laughs> Let's circle back. Let's circle back. So I mentioned that because I, I had made top four of a PTQ with Dan Rodman, mm -hmm. uh, I think in Columbus, before losing to the combination of, I think it was Dust Elemental and Acroma's Memorial. Brutal. Uh, Acroma's Memorial, a big problem. <laughs> really hard card to beat if it resolves. Um, but uh, I remember that tournament not being particularly fun because Robin and I weren't like the best of friends, but we were both good at magic. And we both had nothing to do on that Sunday. So it's just like, yeah, you just want a team together. And it's like, sure. And so like, this is when I met my most spiky and unbearable. And also, he's pretty good at magic. But it vacillates from being super good at magic when he's engaged. And just fine at magic, but thinking he's awesome at magic uh, when he's not that engaged. So, you know, there's just some head butt, like some us butting heads back and forth a little bit. But also it's like, hey, we're trying to qualify for a pro tour here. Like this isn't some random side event. Um but there are people playing in the 2HG PTQ who are just like, hey, 2HG's fun. I want to play with my buddy, whatever. And it's like, yeah, well, I'm trying to qualify for the Pro Tour. And so, like, the incentives there just aren't great. And you could say the same thing about Team Trios, but it feels – it felt different back then. And even kind of feels a little bit different now for what THG is attempting to be as opposed to what it was trying to be uh, for that um, – for those PTQs, and then, of course, for this Pro Tour. Well, the, I, I just don't think it's served to be a competitive format. The branding is part of it, right? Like, two-headed yeah. giant, that sounds like a casual format to me. So to try to pit, and it, and it was, like, a basically a, a pre-release format prior to that PTQ season of Pro Tour. So to try to pivot that into this, like, hyper-competitive thing, yeah, there's going to be people who show up to the tournament and not realize, like, what, what's going on. It's like, no, it's not fun time. It's like, you against Cedric and Rodman, where it's just it's just like bloods on the table. Like it's these people need this way worse than you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, my God, I needed that win, boy. So yeah, the I box. remember Chromos more resolving. I remember Chromos more resolving and me being incredibly angry mm -hmm. that we could not win anymore. So, uh, so Lockman and Van Loon and they win. There were 195 teams. Uh, June 29th to July 1st was this event. And then, of course, we had Kentaro Yamamoto and Yuta Takahashi make the top four of this. Takahashi, at that point, if memory serves, was like 21. I've been watching him play Magic forever. He's extremely good. So the, <clears throat> the idea that he was 21 then is kind of crazy to me. And then uh, your boys, Eugene Harvey and John Fiorello, made the top four. Hell yeah. Nice recovery for John Fiorello because I threw away the finals of Two-Headed Giant States with him. Did you have Two-Headed Giant States? I feel like I assuredly went and didn't do well. Yeah, we lost in the finals. I still remember. I don't know why this loss stands out to me. Probably because I played so bad. But <laughs> And this was, uh, first prize was those like foil EA Mutavaults that were like a couple hundred dollars. So it was like legit. It was like a real prize. I remember, I remember what happened too. So uh, one player has thrill of the hunt in their graveyard. And taps out for something. And, okay, it resolves. Player B becomes, begins to tap for a creature as well. And I go, John, right now, I need to kill that, that creature over there that player A played. I need to kill it with my strangling soot right now. Because they have a thrill of the ha uh, hunt in their graveyard. And they're setting us up to play a land after all this resolves. So we can't soot anything because of the thrill. And John looks at me and he goes, that sounds extremely bad. Like, there's no reason they would ever do that. They would just play their land ahead of time and then cast their thing. But you seem really insistent, so okay, go ahead and do it. So I'm like, okay, kill your thing. And then the player P goes, okay, hey, Sliver, take a million. <laughs> it's like, oh, no. Could have just, oh, no. just, oh. just had soot ready for the hey, Sliver. And then we just lost this game. John, to his credit, was like super, he was super chill about it, even though those losing out on those. So Eugene, one of the absolute just like best to ever do it. 
but he was kind of like out of magic at the time. John was like a talented player. Like he, you know, was on the pro tour for a while, top eight, some grand prix, but he was really, really immersed in playing magic. So it was a really nice partnership. Like they got along. Well, uh, John was just in the weeds on like the strategies and just like what was going on. Eugene was occasionally there to just like find a line that, you know, like the top 20 players in the world can find. And they, uh, they were able to top four. I know that John, John felt that they caught some really bad breaks in their top four loss too. Like they, they felt they could have won that pro tour. Well, we know who did win, uh, which again was Chris Lockman and Jacob Van Lunen with uh, the sliver strategy called the sliver kids. After that, there's also a GP, a couple of them that I'm going to touch on here. Legacy GP in Columbus, Ohio. That's actually where I top four that 2HGP TQ with Rodman. Okay, this makes a little more sense. Uh, attendance 880, which is a pretty big GP back then, because we've definitely mentioned some GPs that were not that size over the past handful of episodes of the Receivables. The winner, Steve Satan with Flash. Mm-hmm. Were you at this GP? I was not. Okay. Um, do you know who built the stack? Oh yeah. Oh dude, I remember this GP extremely, extremely well. Billy Moreno built Steve Satan's deck. Steve Satan had not played a game with the deck leading into the tournament. Uh Texas Billy Moreno. That's right. Broke it. Someone who's built a ton of great decks. Uh some very good Pro Tour finishes, you know, uh, a runner up, uh, top sixteen was on for a while. This is his masterpiece. Because everyone knew Flash was good, and like how much better of a Flash deck can you build once everyone understands what's going on? Turns out quite a bit better. Like this, this deck was was head and shoulders above the room. Billy's deck, I don't know. So you said this is his masterpiece. It's hard for me to argue. Um, I remember coming into that event. The question was, do you play Flash or do you not play Flash? And 2007 version of me was. I'm not going to play Flash. I'll find a deck that beats Flash and play that. Okay, cool. So 2007 version of me was stupid. So that's <laughs> cool. Um, taking a look at the top eight here. Do you remember this tournament that well? Pretty well. I will tell you what I remember about this tournament. Okay. I know that uh, Bill Stark top eighted with Mono Black. That is correct. That was one of the first things I was going to say. Okay. I believe Owen Turtenwald lost in the finals with Goblins. That is also correct. And those are the those are the two that I have. I know uh, if you rattle off the top eight names, I'd be like, oh yeah, oh yeah. But those are the the big standouts to me. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hit some highlights on this event because this tournament was wild. This was a time when Future Sight was not legal for this event question mark checking okay i um i'm almost positive future site was not legal for this event because if it were everyone would have played summoners pact and pact navigation that's right and yeah I, and i believe they did not make it legal for this event so people in the top eight and for those of you wondering, I'm gonna start off with Steve Satan's flash deck. Flash is an instant. Basically, you cast it, you put Protean Hawk on the battlefield. The opponent dies immediately. You could win the game as early as turn one if you want to build your deck that aggressively. Um, but yeah, his deck had top plus counterbalance. Just just listen listen to listen to the cards in this deck. Four top four balance four counterbalance four chrome mocks, four brainstorm four mystical tutor four days for force of will four flash one echoing truth. Uh, a massacre, so you can mystical tutor to get yourself out of problems from hate cards. Four dark confidant, and then the combo pieces, which are four hawk, a carrion feeder, a kiki cheeky, a body snatcher, and a karmic guide. You know, people and got deck was. Go ahead. You know, people got turn zeroed at this event. Yeah, because of gemstone caverns. Yeah, it's like I'll keep seven. It's like okay, before you do anything, caverns, spirit guide, kill you. <laughs> was the yeah, thing that, yeah. that happened. That's right. That's right. Uh, and then the sideboard had Leyline of the Void, which was the counteract this because you need the graveyard to go off. Four Quirion Dryads, three Swords of Plowshares, three Horn Massacres, and a Reverend Silence. This deck is beautiful that, by, that Billy built. Absolutely beautiful. Do you know the winning line uh, from the finals? I don't. Turn one, Satan, Mystical Tutor for Days. Turn two, okay. Flash, Dazer Pyroblast, Kill You. 
Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Mystical Tutor for days is serious mode. <laughs> yeah, th th that's I know I'm gonna win now mode. <laughs> okay. Um, some kid who, rest in peace, Gadiel Cipher. Mm -hmm. He made top eight. Um, he did not have balance plus top. He had peak and limb duels vault, and then a lot of discard and duress and cabal therapy. Limb duels vault, quite busted. Yeah, very powerful card. Um, Gadiel in classic Gadiel form, and I know he's going to come up on this podcast a, a lot when we do uh, like episodes from like Kamigawa Block and stuff like that, that he was just an all-time master just like Kenji was, but played less magic uh, and didn't care as much. But when he did care, he was basically unbeatable. Pro Tour Philadelphia champion, of course. Uh, Gadiel in his like top eight profile, he was just like, yeah, I didn't play any games. And then like one of the questions was, do you think Flash needs to be banned? And he's like, who cares? It's just it was very Gadiel. <laughs> Yeah. Like, you know, none of this matters. I showed up, I won like I always do, and I left. Um, Owen Turtenwald, as mentioned, played Goblins. Do you know the Steve Satan Owen other the other Steve Satan Owen Turtenwald story? I don't I don't know. Okay. Uh so Satan at this event would just cash flash and people would concede. Owen did not <laughs> when Satan cast flash, and Satan was just like Okay, I really don't know how to go off. <laughs> was this at the uh, finals? No, this was the, they played in the Swiss on day two. Okay. So Owen's just like, okay, Flash resolves. And Satan's like going off. And Owen just has a Mog Fanatic on the battlefield and breaks it up with Mog Fanatic. And Steve is just like, ah, shit. Like, just, <laughs> I, everyone's conceded when I've gone off and cast Flash and resolved. And you did not. And then Owen won that match and lost him in the finals. I had an so that's the thing that happened. An experience like that, testing for Pro Tour Columbus, which was extended back in the day, where people we had Mind's Desire in our Gauntlet of decks, and we played um, this this Psychotog deck, worst deck of all time. But um, anytime we would Cunning Wish for Cranial Extraction, and Cranial Extraction, the Desire player in testing. The Desire player would just concede. So I'm playing against Desire at the Pro Tour. A Cunning Wish for Cranial Extraction. And the opponent's like, okay. Cast Cranial Extraction. And they're like, okay, it resolves. <laughs> I just, I'm like, I've never been in this spot before. Like, everyone in testing has just conceded. I forget what I named, but they won very easily the next turn. Like <laughs> and, and, and there was like no card I could name that would have been right. Like they had a workaround for all of it. That was the moment where I was like, our testing went really off the rails. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. Well, that's not great. Uh, Michael Bellafato, he made top eight with, uh, he was actually black white as opposed to mono black. Uh, and I actually do want to touch on the mono black deck list because of how bad it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was so I played Bill Stark in this tournament on day one and I beat him. And then he just didn't lose again. I gave him his second loss and he did not lose another match after this. Naturally, I did not make day two. I'd actually lost on day two to John Sane, uh, playing for day two. And I'll, I'll tell you that story in a second. But this model black deck that Bill Stark played. Now remember, I've read off the Flash deck list. You all know what's in it cards that have been banned and should be banned, cards that could potentially be banned in the future, stuff like that. Here's the deck list. Four Carnifage. Hell yeah. Four, four Order of the Ebon Hand. <laughs> four Stromgold Crusader. Oh god, is that the Cold Snap banger? That's right. Oh god. <laughs> four I want to I want to mention this. This is Legacy. Four Nantuko Shade. Okay. Four Jite. Okay. Jite was actually good against some some setups for the combo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it costs four mana, but it's good. You have Dark uh, Ritual, I hope. I mean, four it, Dark Ritual, four okay. Dark Ritual, four Sarcromancy, four Him, four Unmask, four Duress. The good sideboard, cards. sideboard, uh, sixteen Swamps, four Wastelands, sideboard, four Engineered Plague, four Leyline of the Void, four Serum Powder, three Curse Scroll. Hello and good luck. Sick. That's a that's a, I mean that's a great. A great metagame deck. So if you actually, so let's imagine you're playing against Flash and you go turn one, one drop, 
turn two ritual jite equip. That's actually something, right? Like that does that's, win the I game. Think, I, I think I think that's a thing that can beat them. Yes. Okay. You have duress unmasking him. That's going to be good enough some amount of the time. And like, if you play against a normal deck, you have like a curve of creatures and some discard spells. I don't know. I think this deck is like it's it's very sweet that this deck made the top eight of this tournament because it it is someone like trying very hard to go the other way and succeeding in the face of like an overwhelming opponent. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, Michael Belafato's deck list was black white. He was playing and I can't figure out for the life of me. Why three plague slivers. That's which the is ju- just, that's it's ju- Juzam. It's Juzam. <laughs> yeah. Just four mana, five, five sliver. Uh, uh, <laughs> Don't tell me the white cards. Don't tell me that's Juzam Sliver. Ah, yes. (laughs) That's Juzam Sliver. Yeah. Uh, The white cards in the deck were basically just swords to plowshares. There were three copies, four copies. He had some main deck copies of Contagion. Uh, And yeah, actually, those are the only white cards he was playing, was swords. Okay, sure. Uh, The maximum number of teats, which of course is max teats, Mm -hmm. he was playing uh, fish. And again, this is why deck names suck, because this deck was <laughs> like Esper Aggro, basically. You sure? Yeah. What were you playing? Fish. Are there any Murphle games in your deck? Absolutely not. Right, because uh, because basically there was a time in like the late '90s. I was there for this, where Fish was just a colloquialism for any deck that was like I attack you with creatures and play Force of Will. Every single deck that did that was called Fish, even if they weren't playing Lord of Atlantis. Not great. No, awful. So this deck, four Meddling Mages, four Dark Confidants, three Jotun Grunts, three Mother of Runes, two Sarah Avengers, four Serum Visions, three Duress, four Brainstorm, four Force of Will, four Swords, three Sifle, three Days, two Gites, Lands. Okay. Um, St- Sifle worked against the combo, right? You could Sifle per Pretty sure. Hole. Yeah, okay. Yeah, pretty sure. That's a deck, sure. Uh, Meddling Mage was good against them some amount of the time, like... It's fine. Paul Niccolo, R.I.W. guy. He was playing, a, again, another horrible name for a deck. Canadian Threshold. Mm-hmm. Uh, A.K.A. Teamer Delver. But there were no Delvers. It was Nimble Mongoose, Werebear, and Queer and Dryad. <laughs> Hell yeah. And then uh, Ryan Trepanier, who was a Canadian player, who I knew like all of those, I knew all of that Canadian crew was also playing flash so there's your top eight i don't want to spend too much time on this tournament it was a really really fun tournament though uh that tournament i was playing (laughs) i was playing a jeskai deck with standstill okay okay because i thought that like i kind of had it all figured out right like because in coming into that tournament the goal was to beat two decks it was to it was to beat flash and it was to beat goblins and then mm-hmm. everything else didn't really matter. So I don't remember all of the contents in my deck, but I will tell you unequivocally that I for sure had three copies of Starstorm in my main deck. <laughs> it's not that card's not even good against Bill's deck. <laughs> oh, what? It wasn't what like I played. The only, it's like the only deck in the room where that card could possibly be good, and it's not even good there. So I remember. Brief story, brief story, then we're going to take a break. I remember playing against Sané for day two. Hell yeah. And he's playing Goblins, which I thought was a good matchup at the time coming into the tournament. I was not right about that. And Sané is glacial, to say the least. I and a, I am sitting. Go I, ahead. I have a million John Sané playing slow stories, by the way. I am sitting there <laughs> with a Star Storm in my hand with four open mana. And I'm just waiting. I'm not doing anything. And he's playing goblins. I'm not doing anything, right? And I'm just like, he ain't gonna see this shit coming. <laughs> All right. And it's game. And this is this is when like this isn't a deck. This isn't a known thing. I put a lot of work into this deck on MTG Workstation with a bunch of people, and I'm like, I think I got it, whatever. And I'm just sitting there, and I'm just like, I'm gonna murderize you. However, here's the issue. Game one went like 48 minutes, as it does against John. You know. And like I, I'm like I'm like missing land drops and stuff, but I've just got Star Starstorm for two up, and I'm just like he's eventually just gonna play a War Chief, and I'm just going to humiliate him 
And that's basically what happened. It's like we played like this extremely, extremely, extremely long game one that I think I ended up losing. And I remember I wiped him with Starstorm and then he like rebuilt slowly over the time. My deck didn't have much closing speed. I don't remember. I think my win conditions were factories, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I don't think I had a creature, you know, because back then it was standstill with Mistress Factory. That's how you won. Right. Uh, and so, you know, he was just porting him and wastelanding him. And I was like, okay, I'm not really sure how I'm going to get out of this, you know? Yeah. Uh, deck didn't have what I would call a closing speed, but I just remember sitting there with a star storm and just being like, I can't wait. I'm going to actually get them all. And I did get them all mm -hmm. uh, and ended up, I think, losing the game. And uh, then like in game two, like I'm going to go on and win. And I'm just like, all right, man, this I I'm just like, I'm going to concede. But like your pace of play is just. It's unacceptable. All right. Quick thing about that. But well, then we can do our break. Yeah. John glacially slow. He was a local player like FNM to target. Probably leveled me up more than anyone in, I've ever been around besides Eugene. It's like gr a great player. Not a whole lot of like top finishes of the Pro Tour, but he was just so good for so long. And I was like, John, when you're sitting there playing really slowly in these spots that seem very obvious to me, and I'm like, not as good as you are, what are you thinking about? And he goes, Honestly? I'm like, yeah, honestly. He goes, a lot of the time, nothing. I'm just sitting there. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what kind of answer is that? There's a on, there's a insane. round, there's a there's a timer on the clock. You can't just like, just drifting off into space because, you know, you can't be bothered to take a game action. Yes. Well, with with that, we are going to drift off through the space and take a short break. When we come back, somehow we're almost an hour in. We're going to get into the mechanics, which is just going to be another hour. So see you soon. <laughs> Taking a quick break from the pod to let you know that if you've been enjoying Strixhaven School of Mages preview season as much as I have, and it's a set that Patrick got to work on a little bit too, which is going to make it a great episode for the resleevables in the future, head over to, of course, StarCityGames.com. But Add a little backslash previews on that, if you don't mind. So that's StarCityGames.com slash previews, and that'll take you directly to the page where you can find and pre-order all of these brand new Magic cards, all of the cards from Strixhaven, all of the cards of the Mystical Archive, and all of their various editions, of which there are many. 63 Mystical Archive cards. They're actually pretty cool. Artwork's a little bit different on them. I like Wizards taking a little bit of a risk there. And of course, with this brand new set, there's ideally a lot to look forward to. Again, that's StarCityGames.com slash previews. Get your pre-orders in for Strixhaven School of Mages. Magic goes to college. And now, back to the pod. Alrighty, so let's, uh, let's just get after it right now. I'm going to be upfront and honest with you fine folks. There's a lot of mechanics in this set. Not a lot of cards have these mechanics, and we're going to try to breeze through these as fast as we can, getting Patrick's opinion on each and every single one of them. Uh, let's try to keep it a little short. I'm sure there are some stories and things we can make fun of, but we also have to get through the cycles, of which there are a ton, and then the award show. So here we go. I think this is in alphabetical order or close to it. Mechanic one. This will be a funny game, too, because I'm going to see if you can remember what the mechanics are. You, are you ready? I think so. All right. Mechanic number one. Absorb. What does it do? Don't know. Is it prevent okay. the first X damage that's dealt with something in a turn? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. So, absorb says, absorb N. N could be X or whatever, but if a source would deal damage to this creature, prevent N of that damage. So, if it has absorb 3, if you prevent 3 of that damage, then the rest gets through. Great. Inspired by, me inspired by a mechanic Watsi made for the Star Wars trading card game, uh, there's only one card in the history of magic with absorb. It is limp sliver L Y M P H. <laughs> this set uh, rules. This set just your, kicks so much ass. Your thoughts on absorb as a mechanic. It's not bad. You could actually do like absorb as a real, I mean, I think sort of like ongoing damage shields. Uh, it's ambiguous as combat plays out. The stats on the creature are never actually what the stats on the creature are. All that's, like, problematic and probably a reason to, like, all things being equal, a thing, a reason to not do it. But it's not, like, awful. You could make, like, a half dozen cards in a set with this keyword and it would be okay. But I think it plays pretty 
poorly at low rarities because of uh, of the stuff that I just mentioned about like the sort of the onboard complexity and the tracking of it. Next up, Death Touch. An ability we all know. Whenever this creature deals damage to a creature, destroy that creature. It's a static ability as opposed to a triggered one, like we saw in cards like Thicket Basilisk very early on in Magic's history. Death Touch is primarily both in black and green, prominently featured in Lorwyn block, has 233 cards total, one card in Future Sight, which is Thornwield Archer. Do you know the Archer? Is it like a a 1-1 one, one with Reach and Death Touch for two? It is a two-mana 2-1 two Reach Death Touch, so close enough. 2-1? Busted. Yeah, Death Touch is sweet. It's all over the place. Good evergreen keyword. You know. Whatever. Not a lot to say. Just works. Plays pretty well. About as straightforward, about as, straightforward as it comes, right? Yep. Next up, Delve. Mm-hmm. You may remove any number of cards in your graveyard from the game as you play this spell. It costs one color le- one colorless less to play for each card removed this way. This mechanic was reintroduced in Cons of Tarkir for the Saltai Brood. 25 cards total in Magic's history. Three cards in Future Sight. Tombstalker, Death Rattle, and Logic Knot. Tombstalker saw a decent amount of play in Legacy and other formats. Uh, it's, of course, been outclassed now by things like Tassiger and Gurmag Angler. Uh, Death Rattles removal spell saw a little bit of play, and Logic Knot, oddly enough, actually still sees play. Um, this is your this is your time to get some of your thoughts out about Delve. Well, I I think Delve is a tough keyword to balance because what it needs for draft to function and construct it are very different. Because in draft, it's not trivial to put cards in your graveyard typically, but in constructed because of just like cheap cantrips and fetch lands. It's really easy to do. And uh, as a result, like Delve cards have disproportionately showed up in Constructed. Like of all cards that have it, like way more than your average keyword share show up in decks. Because if you make them like decent for draft, they become really good in Constructed typically. Like even Gurmag Angler and Hooting Mandrels are like features of Legacy. I do like it insofar as I'm a big fan of keywords that say, don't play 10 of this keyword, just find one that you like and play with it and have like a bunch of different one of keywords in your deck. And because the first delve card you play is, is pretty low cost, but the second, third, fourth one, they really start to add up. There is a sampling element of the keyword that I'm really sympathetic to, but the balance issues are, are really hard to solve. They're, they're basically unsolvable. Like, if you make the cards reasonably appropriately costed for draft, they're likely to be way above rate for constructed. And that's basically been the history of the keyword. It's a powerful one. I don't know if we knew it was going to go the way that it did in cons when they did, of course, treasure cruise and dig through time and task and everything else. But I mean, they really pushed the envelope with it. Then those cards got banned pretty quickly. These cards are all good. Um, I don't know. I would say I, I could argue that Logic Knot's great, but you know I think that has a lot to do with fetch lands. But also, you could argue it's just I don't know. You just play the game of Magic. Logic Knot's going to be a counter spell most of the time. Yeah, it's hard for it to miss because early on, it's like takes very little usually to counter, and then later on in the game, um, you know you should have a stocked graveyard so you can just make it like you know X equals ten or whatever. But I don't mind that. Like, uh, you know, if, if someone wants to use their graveyard as a resource to get, like, a handful of copies of, like, Counterspell, but slightly worse in their deck, that's, like, not egregious to me. All right, next one. Fate Seal. Mm-hmm. This one... Okay, I'm not going to ask you what this one is yet either. Because this one's, like, pretty straightforward because of Jace, but it's Fate Seal N. Look at the top N cards of an opponent's library, then put any number of them on the bottom of that player's library and the rest on top in any order. Uh, based on the mechanic of the Mirage card Sealed Fate. Hell yeah. It was it was considered by Watsy to be a very unfun mechanic and is not expected back. Two cards total, both in Future Sight, Mesmeric Sliver, and Spin into Myth. So basically, Spin into Myth, I think that was a bounce spell. I'm going to check. Y'all can hear me typing. Yeah, so this was five mana, four and a blue instant. Put out your creature on top of its owner's library, then Fate Seal 2. 
So it was oftentimes a removal spell, and you can argue better than that, which was, yeah, put that thing on top of your deck. I can choose to leave it on top of your deck if I want to, or I can put that on the bottom and then figure out what I'm going to do with your next card as well. Um, can It's already been stated that it's very unlikely to come back, and I... I I can't see something like this coming back. This seems extremely powerful and extremely unfun if it was on cheap if it was on cheap cards. It's awful. Like the most fun I, I think like I I don't know if I would say it's the most fun, but one of the most fun things about magic is your draw step and the hope that even if the game is going badly for me, the draw step can change it. At least for a turn. And when your opponent fade seals you. It's either the experience that they left it on top, whatever I'm drawing is not helpful, or they put it on the bottom. What I was about to draw would have been helpful, and instead I'm drawing a random card that's very likely to be much less helpful. It's like really, really, really bad. Really, really bad. <laughs> not surprising to me that even though it's fairly simple, and it's like, oh, it's scribe, but reverse, like it's an easy thing to port in. Um, that this this one hasn't come back because it's just so hostile to what like one of the most fundamentally fun parts of Magic's game engine. All right, now we got a tough one here for you. Fortify. Mm-hmm. Do you know what Fortify is? Give me a moment here. I want to think about this some before I answer. Okay. Is it like an enchant land? Incorrect. Wait. Oh. No, I'm not going to give it to you. It's not Enchant Land. Okay, my my, I I know this. The answer I gave is not right, but for whatever reason, what popped into my head was it's somehow adjacent to Enchanting Lands. Yeah, you equip your land. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> but they don't have power and toughness. <laughs> Usually, well, how does that work? <laughs> so here is here's here's how this works. All right, I'm going to read Darksteel Garrison because it's the only card that has Fortify in Magic's history. Okay. Uh, it's two colorless. Artifact-Fortification, much like it says Artifact-Equipment. Fortified land is indestructible. So if it's fortified, it's indestructible. Mm-hmm. Whenever fortified land becomes tapped, target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. And then Fortify's cost to equip the land is three. <laughs> okay. So you basically, you play Dark Soul Garrison for two mana. You equip it for three. You equip a land for three mana. That land is now indestructible because it's fortified. And whenever the land becomes tapped, target creature gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. Okay. Uh, my notes on this are it's exactly the same as equip, except that it affects a land instead of a creature. Rosewater has considered the mechanic difficult to implement as the typical sanctity of lands <laughs> limits both the utility of reusability that equipment holds and the ability to put powerful effects on fortifications. Basically, like, the first fortify card that is too good is a disaster. That's really hilarious. Oh, yeah, hard to implement. Really burying the lead there. Okay, so... Tapping your land to do something is not the most interesting thing because you can do it at any time for no cost. So there is something about like, do I sit on, do I tap this land now or later for the effect? But it's, the gameplay is pretty like marginal, like that it matters that it's on a land versus just being an enchantment or an artifact. Giving a land indestructible just doesn't matter in a practical sense very much because just lands don't get destroyed that often. To the extent that lands get destroyed, it's usually like pinpoint so they can just blow up another land. And it's extremely confusing. Like the ratio of how complicated this is to explain versus what gameplay is actually there is really bad. This card, this card, we're never going to see this again. Yeah, this one ever. is... Ever. Don't say ever. Don't say ever. But I think it's really unlikely. I think my favorite thing about covering this... It's just a long time. I guess, yeah. My favorite thing of covering this set is just some of these things I just forgot about. Like, Nick Miller messaged me, and he's like, Fortify, you gotta be kidding me. And I'm like, dude, it's gotta be worse than that. So, let's go to the next one. Do you remember Frenzy? Uh... No, I don't. Okay. Frenzy N... Whenever this creature attacks and it isn't blocked, it gets plus X plus O until end of turn, which is whatever. 
the frenzy number is. Okay. Uh, a mechanic made to encourage blocking. <laughs> Rosewater has. Sh- <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> Doesn't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> like well, that's just a really weird way of that's like a really weird way of describing like what's happening like it only it only, okay i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off i'm sorry please finish your thoughts <laughs> no you're fine you're fine <laughs> rosewater rosewater has tried to put friends in <laughs> In multiple sets, but play design is not a fan, st- stating that the play pattern is not particularly fun. Well, I, I uh, think, I actually don't, like, I don't think the gameplay is that bad. Like, it's not outrageous to consider putting this in the set. I guess my my problem with it is, is I really, I'm not typically a huge keyword, a fan of keywords that are like, you get A or B. A is literally just what's written on your card. You don't get any bonus. And uh, B is a thing your opponent basically has agency over. The gameplay isn't that bad. It's just, I think there's a lot of ways to change this keyword in like slight ways that are just better executions. Uh, Apparently two cards in Magic's history have Frenzy. One of them in this set, Mm -hmm. which is Frenzy Sliver. (laughs) Which is... All Sliver creatures have Frenzy 1. Okay. What color do you think Frenzy Sliver is? Well, I would assume red, based on name yeah, and mechanic. Yeah, it's black. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not... I, I guess that would probably be my second choice, but it's a pretty distant second, if it's even second. All right, let's get to mechanic that did see some playing constructed. Grandeur. Oh, I just... I really... I'm sorry. I just love that description. Of this keyword that's just like, if you don't block this, you're dead. And it's like, yeah, this was meant to encourage blocking. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not it's not the most subtle thing. Sorry. We just want to make sure that everybody knows. Right. That's all. <laughs> In case that's you didn't all. know, this was to make people want to block. Uh, Grandeur, which, which was discard another card named whatever the card is named, and then you get to do something. Most notably on Corlash, Heir to Blackblade, but we'll get to these five cards in a moment. Rosewater called the return of Grandeur unlikely due to Commander. The problem is that it's tied to legendary creatures, yet meaningless in Commander, the format that cares the most about the legendary creature uh, super type. It has been discussed if Grandeur could be put on non-legendary creatures. Five Grandeur cards. There was Oris, Samite Guardian, Lanessa, Zephyr Mage, Corlash, Heir to Blackblade, Blackblade, excuse me, Terox Bladewing, and Baru Fist of Croja. Basically, if you controlled one of these creatures on the battlefield, you could discard a redundant copy, redundant in quotes, and an effect would happen. In the instance of Corlash, I believe it was two swamps that you got. I don't think they went on the battlefield, but I do want to check. Oh no, you put them onto the battlefield tapped. Nice. You search your, you search your library for up to two swamp cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped. So basically, I could on turn four, you like you play Corlash. You discard another core lash and you've double ramped in your mystical teachings deck, and that was pretty good. So, what do you think about Grandeur? So, I think the the comments about uh, Commander are like they're definitely salient, and I think Commander is is such a huge part of Magic that you can't just be like, "Well, it doesn't work in Commander." Like that's not a a, a reasonable response. But set that aside, I think Grandeur like rules. I think that keyword is so good. Because there's all this pressure on you to, like, what, well, what do you do with your legendary cards? You play four copies and then just get, like, screwed some amount of the time. Playing against someone who's built around legendary cards can often be frustrating because it's like, well, if I kill this thing, am I just opening it up to now the second copy's freed up? And Grandeur solves it in a way that's really elegant and also dynamic. It's not just, like, more of the same, but your Corlash is different. And drawing the second copy is not just, like, all upside because there's times where... Like, I don't want two swamps. I want, like, what this card is supposed to be or whatever. So it's a really creative way of solving um, the, some of the issues that arise with legendary cards in a way that's dynamic. Uh, I, I I really love this keyword a lot, but I, I, I also totally am sympathetic to the idea that it doesn't play well in Commander, and so you should try to find 
other ways of of promoting legendary cards. So I'm going to give you the rundown of the five grandeur cards really quick. Mm -hmm. See if you remember any of these. I'm just going to I'm going to ask you if you remember them. You're probably not going to, but uh, let's start with the white one, Oris Samite Guardian. I don't know. All right, one white, white, one three, legendary human cleric. Tap, prevent all damage that would be dealt to target creature this turn. Grandeur, discard another uh, Oris. Target player can't cast spells this turn, and creatures that player controls can't attack this turn. Awesome. I mean, it's a little... Pretty powerful. They're, they're, I mean, potentially concerns about looping or whatever, but this is a really cool design. We'll go to blue. Lanessa, Zephyr Mage. Uh, three and a blue. Three, three, legendary human wizard. It was uh, for blue, blue, X, and tap. Return target creature with converted mana cost X to its owner's hand. Grandeur, target player returns a creature they control to its owner's hand, then repeats this process for an artifact, an enchantment, and a land. Cool. Card, server, card does something, and then it does something different if you do the thing. Great. Cor Corlash, heir to black blade, 2 BB, star star. Power and toughness equal to the number of swamps you control. Legendary zombie warrior, 1 and a B, regenerate, Corlash, discard, uh... Discard for Grandeur, two swamps, that ETB tapped. That one's pretty powerful uh, and could fuck up combat and burn spells and stuff if they added redundant copies. So that one was the most pushed of the bunch. Not sure how you look at that one now. Uh, it's a little weird from a color pie perspective. Like, I would prefer for green to get the explosive vegetation one in the cycle. But, um, you know, this is another one that's like, yeah, I think this is just super cool. Like um makes your card different um and not just more of the same and but not just like strictly better than drawing a different card if you uh even if you can enable the grandeur Terox blade wing two rrr four three legendary dragon flying haste grandeur uh Terox blade wing gets plus x plus x until end of turn where x is its power so if you grandeur you turn this thing into an eight eight if you draw another copy, you can turn it into a 1616. Or 1615, excuse me. Sweet. I like this one a lot, actually. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm I, I mean I know the cycle outside of Corlash didn't really make like a ton of competitive splash, and the nature of it means that it can't really be a commander thing. But I think this keyword's uh, doing a lot of really good stuff. Uh last one, Baru Fist of Croza. 3GG, 4-4, four, four, Legendary Human Druid. When a forest comes into play, green creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and gain trample until end of turn. Grandeur, create an XX green worm creature token where X is the number of lands you control. I think, before we move on to the next mechanic, I would be totally fine if they could figure out a way to rework this and have it come back because I think these cards are flavorful, flavorful excuse me, and cool. And yeah, I would love to see this actually come back. If they could figure out a way to massage what's going on in commander to make it so that it fits all audiences. I think it's actually a really cool mechanic. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan. If you're only going to do five of these to make one, get two swamps and power toughness equal to swamps. And another one, make a token with power toughness equal to the number of lands. Like that's just not different enough for, for my sensibilities. Um, but again, you know, uh, I, I am very warm towards this keyword in general. <laughs> All right, moving on to one you're not going to like then. Gravestorm. Mm. <laughs> Hell when yeah. You play this, when you play this spell, copy it for each permanent put into a graveyard from play this turn. You may choose new targets for the copies. Rosewater says it's unlikely to be reused due to having the same problems as Storm. One card total, bitter ordeal. What say you before I go over bitter ordeal? Uh, I... I kind of feel the same way about this that I feel about Storm, which is there's the kernel of something good here if you just capped it or made it like a threshold. But the problems emerge from it being completely open-ended. Um, and tracking permanence going to the graveyard is not like... It, it's not the easiest thing to track your, your graveyard in general that way. And tokens are a, a really complicated dimension to add to that. But it's not... Again, this is not like the worst. It's just... Uh, uh, much like Storm, I feel like you're better served just trying to come up with a way to make it a cap or a threshold and then just give something a kicker rather than trying to 
balance around, well, what happens when 12 or 14 or copies of this are firing off in one turn? Uh, Bitter Ordeal was two and a B, so three mana black sorcery. Search target player's library for a card and exile it, then that player shuffles their library. Graystorm, as I mentioned, when you cast this spell, copy it for each permanent put into graveyard this turn, you may choose new targets for the copies. So there you go. Uh, this one's easy. Lifelink. Damage dealt by this creature also causes you to gain that much life. R&D, R&D used to call this ability uh, Spirit Link. Notably, Spirit Link doesn't have the exact Life Link ability because Spirit Link is triggered. Uh, it used to be a triggered ability. That used the stack. Life Link does not use the stack. It just happens. It's a static ability. Uh, two cards in Future Sight with Life Link. Uh, one was Daybreak Coronets, which of course he's playing Slesnia Hexproof because I refuse to call that deck Boggles. And then Uncommon on Mist Meadow Skulk. Pretty straightforward stuff. Life Link's good for the game. Yeah, it's sweet. I think the rules change is, like, just correct. Most, like, normal human beings would just assume that my lifelinker inside of combat would just add damage to my life total the same way that a tribal creature deals damage the same time that everything else does. Uh, Gameplay is good. Yeah, positive. Good keyword. Beautiful. Moving on. Poisonous. This was on Virulent Sliver and Snake Cult initiation poisonous n whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player that player gets n poison counters a player with 10 or more poison counters loses the game this was rosewater planting a flag in the ground that poison was going to return one day obviously it did uh as infect via glistener elf blighted agent and so much more we'll talk more about infect i think once we get to blighted agent and that set which was i think new phyrexia if memory serves well it was it was through the block the, the the more powerful the block, ones came one yeah. yeah but scars of mirrodin had impact creatures so yeah 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 you're right so it's it's the return of mirrodin block but what are your uh, what are your thoughts on poisonous as a uh, as a mechanic not a huge fan like it's an alternate win condition but it basically works the same way as regular damage and it's a ton of subsidization because like everything basically has double power the thing that it's balanced around is the card pool being really limited like you can only play with with like the handful of poison or infect creatures that exist. But that means if it's good enough to play, you're just playing with like the same three or four cards over and over again. It's like, it's okay. Um, you know, it still is fundamentally about attacking and blocking. Um, but it, I just don't think like the, it's a particularly interesting way to get an alternate wing condition over. Next up reach. This creature can block creatures with flying. Used to be known as a spider ability. Primarily green, but also shows up in red and white. One card in the future site, which was Thornweld Archer. Basically, they stopped having it be this creature may block as though it has flying and gave it a keyword. Makes a lot of sense. Anything to note here? Not really. I mean, I wish that the word was slightly more evocative for spiders. Because, like, the, the trope is that they're caught in a net. But, like, the spider itself isn't really reaching up. But whatever. <laughs> Plays well. Small criticism in the scheme of things. Uh, and again, just like like Lifelink and Death Touch, it's just like a evergreen keyword. Like, not everything that came out of the set is just like total gobbledygook. Like, there are some fundamental executions on, like, improvements to keywords or keywording repeated clauses that, like, have definitely improved the game. Moving on. Shroud. This permanent can't be the target of spells and abilities introduced in Legends, keyworded in Future Sight, and made obsolete by Hexproof. One card in Future Sight, which was Quagnoth. Um, I mean, Shroud's just kind of gone, which I think is a good thing. I know a lot of people don't really like Hexproof, so do you have any thoughts on either one of those mechanics? Um, I, I think there's a conflation that goes on. Like, I understand sometimes you can't target your opponent's creature with a removal spell. And the core conceit of the game is that you're allowed to do that sort of thing, and it can be frustrating. I really don't like it showing up on one mana creatures because then the gameplay is just like double bunch of enchantments and and win the game before it starts. I really, really, really don't like it on Invisible Stalker because if you're gonna say, "Well, I can't target this thing," you got you gotta let me block. Like you gotta give me some dimension where there's like a game that's going on. I. Don't mind it at all on things like Carnage Tyrant because like a ton of game has gone on leading up to this moment. There's a bunch of sideways workarounds for it. And it's really there to keep 
certain types of cards and strategies in check rather than just being a proactive thing in its own right, like Invisible Stalker or any of the 1-1 one mel- one, one Hexproof creatures. So I think there's examples of it that is bad execution, and some of those examples have showed up a lot in Constructed, and that sort of distorts the conversation. But I think you can come up with a ton of Hexproof creatures that just like play reasonably well. Here we go. Aura Swamp. No... No clue what this is. <laughs> well, I think the actually I think the card is actually called Aura Swap. One sec. No, it's called uh Arcanum Wings. Yeah, this should be good. <laughs> Alright, so Aura Swap is you pay a cost, exchange this aura with an aura card in your hand. Primarily a blue ability, uh, which is true <laughs> because it only shows up on one card and it's blue. <laughs> Primarily a blue <laughs> ability. <laughs> There's yeah, only one, it's a good so it's 100% of them. <laughs> That's a good note. Uh, Ro- Rosewater considers the chance of it ever being reprinted likely, um, probably in a set with an Aura sub-theme. We have seen sets with Aura sub-themes with Bestow, and we have not seen this come back. Uh, the one card to feature site, Arcanum Wings, is the following. One in a blue, Enchantment Aura, enchant- Enchanted Creature has Flying, Aura Swap, two in a blue, which is exchange this Aura with an Aura card in your hand. Your thoughts? Uh, it seems like if you did a lot of this, the purpose would be so much more about show and telling in some huge enchantment than it would be about like, oh, I have this versatile array of stuff and sometimes I want to swap it. So that seems troubled to me. I think there's like an enchantment that gives something plus 20 plus 20. I think there was one, like a green one. Sure. I mean, I'm not even talking about cards that actually exist. I'm just talking about in the hypothetical where it's like, oh, we want to make this in a a mechanic in the set and make like a bunch of versions of this, uh, a, bu- a bunch of cards with this keyword. It's like, to me, what this is about is just about cheating big stuff into play. Not about the like, oh, this turn I want lifelink. Next turn I want trample or whatever the, the hypothetical is. Next up is transfigure. Do you remember what this is? Nope. It's on one magic card in Magic's history. It's called Flesh Rider. Uh, it is... Where is it? You pay a cost, sacrifice this creature. Search your library for a creature card with the same converted mana cost as that creature and put it into play and shuffle your library. So Flesh Rider was 2 BB. So 4 mana, 3, 3. Transfigure for 1 BB. So you sacrifice that, and you can get another creature that costs 4 mana on the, and put it on the battlefield. You can only play this ability as a sorcery. There'll probably be no problems there. Uh, I mean, there are some... Some problems. This rate's so bad that it doesn't just doesn't ever come up. I don't know. This is another like cheating something that has a weird mana cost seems much more the thing than like oh, I have this toolbox of options to go get with my hill giant. Uh, I'm noting here that that's also unlikely to ever come back. We got two left. One of them's tribal. It's a card type which must uh, which must always appear with another card type. No longer supported by R and D. Rosewater announced its death knell when it wasn't used in Innistrad, a set with a very strong tribal theme around vampires and such. 54, 54 excuse me, tribal cards total, one in Future Sight. Can you name the card that had tribal in Future Sight? Mm. There's no way. Give me a second on this one. I think you're probably right, but I want to give it a moment. Tribal. No, I don't have it. I don't have it. Bound in silence. <laughs> oh, it's the rebel pacifism. That's correct. Of course. Yes. That's right. Search that one up. Yeah. With the Rosie and Sergeant yep. or whatever. Yeah. Well, not with Sergeant, uh, right? It costs three. You need the which, lieutenant. Yeah, the, the Falcon or whatever. The I don't lieutenant. know, man. You need the lieutenant for that The one. lieutenant, sure. Um, What do you think about tribal? It's, go- it's basically gone now. I don't think it's coming back. Uh, I think they're, like... The flavor's not bad. Like, you cast a tar fire and then a goblin cares that you cast a goblin spell. It's like, it's a really easy thing to buy into. The rules are a little bit tricky. I, I wish that Tribal didn't uh, also appear with, like, Changeling and just, like, that to me is just, like, this constellation of things aren't what they say they are and there's all these, like, weird triggers emerging in non-intuitive spots. But I am a believer in, like, tar fire triggers your goblin card. I think that's fine. I like 
tribal, and I hope it comes back because I was a really big fan of Lorwyn Block. Yeah, I just don't. I I don't like changeling and spells that have creature types and and it. You know what I mean? It's just like at a certain point, the art and the names have to line up too to make any of this make sense. Which is why like Tarfire plus the Goblin is the example I keep coming back to because that's one that's like yeah, I, I think there's a ton of like novice magic players that would assume that it worked that way in the first place. So that that to me is a much easier sell. Last one. Type cycling. <laughs> yeah. Allows players to search your library for a card of a certain subtype. Two cards in future sight. Uh, Vidalkin, Ether Mage, which was wizard cycling. Homing Sliver, which was sliver cycling. Your thoughts? Okay, at a modest rate. I mean, I don't like a whole lot of tutoring and, you know, makes games repetitive, balance issues, whatever. But, like, you know, it's also good to give... As long as you sort of like relegated to these tribes that are not very powerful or have consistency issues. The rates on these are so modest that they don't even like really stand out very much. All right. Um, they also brought back bloodthirst convoke cycling dredge graft hellbent scry and transmute. They just did it all in this set. Um, we're not going to grade each mechanic individually. Actually, you know what we are? Screw it. Give me an A through F. I'm going to go through them all. Absorb. C. Death Touch. A. Delve. B. B? B. C. Okay. Fate Seal. F. <laughs> Fortify. F. Frenzy. Uh, C. Grandeur. B. Gravestorm. Uh, D. Lifelink. A. Poisonous. C. Reach. A. Shroud. Uh, C. Aura Swap. <laughs> uh, d uh, D. Transfigure. Uh, C. Tribal. B. Type Cycling. C. Boom. Mechanics done. Short break. Cycles. See you in 90 seconds. Taking a quick break from the podcast to let you know that the road to the Strixhaven Championship begins with the SD Tour Online. We are back. We are better than ever. The road to the Call Time Championship was fun, but you know what? That's over and done. Either you're qualified or you're not. And if you're not, it's kind of a whammy. If you are, congratulations to you. But the good news is, is that you have the opportunity to qualify for another championship that will be taking place on Magic Arena. As I mentioned, the road to the Strict Saving Championship begins with the SCD Tour Online, where we got cash prizes, we got tens of thousands of MTG Arena gems, MTG Arena Qualifier Weekend invitations, and best of all, the thing that you care about, Strix Haven Championship invitations. Head over to scdtouronline.starcitygames.com. Find a satellite that works for you. Learn information about the 5K Strix Haven Championship qualifiers and figure out how you can qualify for that Strix Haven Championship like so many are going to be attempting to do over the next handful of weeks. We just updated everything earlier this week, so all the details are there for you to qualify for the Strixhaven Championship. One more time with that slogan so it really gets in that brain. The road to the Strixhaven Championship begins with the SCD Tour Online. Now, with that, back to the pot! All right, everybody, we're back now. Cycles, cycles, cycles. There are a decent number of these. We're almost to the award show, I promise. Um, we get to play one of my favorite games, Patrick. Mm. I tell you the names of the Maguses. You tell me what cards they reference. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, this Magus cycle, of course, features uh, its creatures featuring abilities of enchantments, enchantments from previous sets. Magus of the Moat. Moat. <laughs> Magus of the Future. Future Sight. Magus of the Abyss. The Abyss. <laughs> Magus of the Moon. Blood Moon. Magus of the Vineyard. Eladomre's Vineyard. Five for five, folks. Ring a ding ding. Did you like this Magus cycle? I mean, many of these cards are just atrocious play patterns that are only sort of solved by making them a creature and therefore somewhat easy to kill. But like Blood Moon, the Abyss, and Boat are three of like 
bottom X designs all time. So, you know, dubious. <laughs> dubious indeed. They're just not that strong. Um, Magus of the Moon shows the, up a little bit, but we had the pack cycle. Yeah. Free rares, free rare spells that require an upkeep cost to be paid, or you lose the game. Uh, Intervention Pact, which is the white one. Okay, do you know what? Okay, I'm just gonna ask you. Intervention Pact, what's it do? Um, either prevents or redirects damage. You gotta pick one. Um, redirects. I'm sorry, it's prevent and you gain life. <laughs> Gaining life and then losing the game is pretty sweet. <laughs> the, next, the, next time, the next time a source of your choice would deal damage to you this turn. Prevent that damage. You gain life equal to the damage prevented this way. Uh, upkeep cost? Uh, white, white, one? Correct. Well done. Can I just real uh, quick about the packs? One of my favorite things. Again, Aaron Forsyth comes up in these. His columns were extremely influential for me at this time. And they're previewing future site. And Aaron goes like, it, they bring up the packs and Aaron's like, please God, just please pay these at the pre-release. Like you will lose the game. <laughs> you don't. I know that's really frustrating. Just please remember to pay for these. I think losing the game is a humbling experience that everyone should go through. It'll make them better magic players and probably better people. Uh, Pact of Negation. It's counter spell and with an upkeep of three blue blue. Slaughter Pact. Uh, destroy target non-black creature with an upkeep of black and two colorless. Checking. I think that you're right on non-black. I believe it's dark banishing. Is you are the, correct. Is the thing. Yeah. Pack, Pact of the Titan. Get a You get a 4-4 four, four flash, homie, and you got to pay four, uh, four colorless and red on the next upkeep. And Summoner's Pact. Uh, tutor for a green creature, and then pay... Green, green, two. Uh, yeah, you're nine to ten. You were close on an intervention pact. I'll give you, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a half on that one mm-hmm. because you got the upkeep cost right. So nine and a half out of ten. Appreciate you. Uh, we went over the grandeur cycle, so we'll go to the future shifted dual land. <laughs> <laughs> I That's right. It, does every single time you describe a cycle, it sounds like Mad Libs? <laughs> yeah, it's it, I, dude. I haven't it's even gotten so to Mad Libby. Okay, yeah. Here, all right. Let's see if you know what these cards do. Nimbus Maze. So that's the blue dual land. I think it's tap for a blue if you have a plains or tap for a white if you have an island. It also taps for a colorless too. Uh, I really like this cycle and I hope it comes back. Is it too powerful? Well, this, I like Nimbus Maze specifically. Is this card like too good? No. I mean, I think this card is probably worse than um, Glacial Fortress for, like, low-power formats. So I think you could definitely do it. Yeah, I want it to come back. I don't know. I really like it. Uh, River of Tears. Um, It is tap for a blue, but if you play to land this turn, it taps for a black. Correct. Okay. And when it, you play it itself, it taps for a black. Right, because you've played a land. Confusing. That's correct. A little bit, yeah. Interesting cycle there. I'm not sure how good that one is, but that's the only one we've ever seen of it. There's just a lot of ways to do a dual land that are just so much less complicated. It's, like, cool as a one of design, but, like, what's the point of making ten of those? Graven Cairns. Tap for a colorless, or tap it, and either red or black... To make R R B B or R B. Filterland cycle. We have all ten. Yep. These are these are cool. Your thoughts? It's okay. Okay. Yeah, it's cool. Grove of the Burn Willows. Tap for a colorless or tap it for a red or green and uh target opponent gains one. Thoughts on that card and or cycle? Uh incentives are too bad. I I, I think that it's just too much like um it's either play with no pressure and just ignore the fact that your opponent's gaining life or actively punishing your opponent for gaining life in a in a place where they have no agency to make it stop. Like, it's not... I, I think that, like, the honest use case of, like, it's just a dual land, 
and I'm giving you some life and whatever, that's fine. But it, the incentives break down in the competitive setting, I think, pretty quickly. Last one's Horizon Canopy. Tap it for a green or a white and take one point of damage. Or uh, tap it and one and sacrifice it and draw a card. And we have seen this cycle get mostly filled out in enemy colors. We haven't seen all of the allied color versions yet. Your thoughts? Uh, I am sympathetic towards lands that are like, you want to play a long game, but you also have to have a tolerance for taking damage off of your lands. So it kind of excludes them from the most controlling decks. And they're just like a tool for beatdown decks um that want to be able to play a longer game which i think is a really good thing to incentivize i think on rate these things are just too strong for standard it it would be like a a distorting thing to have around but for more high power formats i think these cards do really good work all righty next cycle <laughs> the auger creatures uh, i don't remember these at all Commons with sacrifice oh, abilities that can only be activated this. in I your upkeep. I do remember key. this now. I thought you would. Let's start with Augur Ilvec. It's the black one? Pretty sure. No, that's the white one. Oh. Um, then I don't remember. The black one I have a story about, but... Okay, so basically, I, 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 don't, I don't care about power, toughness, creature type, none of that stuff. Just what do you think the sacrifice ability on upkeep is? Uh, gain life. How much? Four. Correct. Okay. Aven Augur. Uh, draw a card? I am sorry, it is unsummon. Okay. Oh, excuse me. It's undo. It's bounce two creatures. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to save the black one. I, I have to imagine you know this one. Ember Wild Augur. Uh, sack to deal, two to a player. Three to a player. Checking. Three. Right, because it was a 2-1 for R1, right? That's correct. You know, I, I top aided a, an Invitational with the Descendant of this card in my center deck. What card was that again? I can't remember. It was very Furnace bad. Furnace Scamp. Yes, the Scamp. Uh, Llanowar Augur. Um, I don't know. Plus three, plus three, and Trample. Okay. Really can't see that coming. Mm -hmm. So just on board, Sorcerer, Speech, Giant, Growth, Sword of Predator Strike, I guess. And then Augur of Skulls, which you should know. So it's a Black and Colus 1-1 one, one that regenerates for a Black and Colus, and you can sack it to Mind Rot them on your upkeep. All right, what's your story? Uh, so I was testing for U.S. Nationals, the tournament where I played you and you just you just beat the shit out of me. Um, You're damn right I did. And I worked my ass off on a black splash green. Like, the deck had the rack, funeral charm, this card, Tarmogoyf. Like, all the things you'd imagine. Like, a, a bunch of attrition cards, good cheap threats, and, like, the rack. And it's one of those, like, I just, the deck was like 45% against everything. Like, it was fine, and you had draws that were really good, but it was just, like, just not quite there. And BR and Antonio DeRosa, who I was playing with, were just like, put this thing down. Like, just d please don't play this deck or whatever. So eventually I decided not to, and I played, like, the Dark Confidant hit run deck or whatever. And round one of Nationals, I got paired against black green, like just the deck I built and he beat the piss out of me. Like it was, it was just like one of the most solid two O's, like just neither game in doubt at any point that I've played that I've had, had against me in a professional setting. Um, and then it, the tournament did not get better from there. <laughs> it's a humbling feeling, isn't it? Well, kind of, because you also feel like, smart at the end of it. You're like, yeah, this deck was sweet. Because it just totally kicked the shit out of the thing that I was playing. <laughs> yeah, you're like, you're like, I'm on to something. I don't have it quite finished yet. Time to move on to something else. And then you play against that something. And it's like, damn it. Yeah, my opponent was just like, damn it. He was on the draw. And he's just like, funeral charm, your dark confidant. 
untap auger. And I'm like, all right, it's over. Like, I'm just, <laughs> I have no chance here. It's beaten to death by a Tarmogoy for whatever. And that's game. That was game. It was game. So I know that uh, one. The common, the common cyclers, there are five of them. We're not going to go over all of them. Uh, Marshland Cry, Fidalkin, Aether Mage, Icarus Slick, Homing Sliver, and Edge of Autumn. There were the Future Shifted Slivers in Lymph Sliver, which had Absorb, Mesmeric Sliver, which had Fate Seal, Frenzy Sliver, which had Frenzy, Homing Sliver, which had Sliver Cycling, and Virulent Sliver, which had Poisonous. Nice job on my brain there. Monocolored Ability Lands, New Banalia. Yeah, you like that? New, Bana- New Banalia, or as I call it, New Banana. Uh, Dakmore Salvage. Lanawar Reborn, which was the graft land. Worst magic online design, or one of the worst. Ever. Yeah, so ever. bad. Uh, Keldern Megathus, Megalithus. Mm-hmm. And then Teleria West, which is an all time banger. Mm-hmm. Suspend spells that can go back on suspend after playing them. I don't know if you remember this cycle, but there was Chronomanic Escape, Reality Strobe, Festering March, Arc Blade, and Cyclical Evolution. Basically, you'd put these cards on suspend, they would go off, and they'd go back on suspend, so they're just in suspend and on suspend in perpetuity. Uh, yeah, uh, Arc Blade, I remember. From... I think that card was good, I think. It was, I think it was much weaker than it seemed. In draft, at least. I'm going to read it right now. Arcblade was 3 RR, sorcery. Deals 2 damage to target creature or player. Remove Arcblade from the game with 3 suspend counters on it. And its suspend cost was 2 and a red suspend 3. Yeah, so, yeah, this was not that strong. It seemed like a sicko on read. You're just like, yeah, just kill their thing. They have nothing. Like, deal 2 to them, reset it, and it's hard for them to play 2 dudes for the rest of the game. It just didn't play out that way very often. Uh, we had some common scry spells in Judge Unworthy, for C, Putrid Cyclops, Riddle of Lightning, a personal favorite of mine and many others for big red decks, and Land of War, uh, what is this, Land of War Rebirth? Land of War Empath, excuse me. Textlist Future Shifted Vanilla Creatures. Yes. An important story here. Let's, okay, let's see if you know the five and then you can tell your story. Blade of the Sixth Pride. White and a colorless 3-1. Blind Phantasm. Blue and two colors, two, three. Mass of Ghouls. Uh, uh, black and four colors, four, four. BB3, five, three. Formori for Nomad. Uh, is it a three, three for green, two? Oh, I'm thinking, that's the, that's the, sorry, that's the green one. The red one is um, yeah. uh, R444. There it is. Yeah. And then Nessian Corsair is right. 2G33. Story time, you're up. So Matt Place came and worked at Cryptozoic. Huge influence on me. Biggest, biggest influence in my career leveling up as a game designer. He worked on Future Sight. And... You have a lot of jitters when you're working on a set like that because you're like, are people going to see everything that's going on here? Because it's so much stuff, right? And the set's like really ambitious in a lot of respects. And you're just hoping like, does this any of this come through to the average player who's not like super invested, who goes to the, you know, just plays every now and again? Is this all going to look like nonsense to them? Or are they going to see it, you know? So he's at the pre-release. And he's sitting next to someone. This person does not know that Matt works on magic. He's just at the Brulees. And this person holds up a mass of ghouls and says, why does this have a weird frame? And Matt's like, oh, God, we screwed up. Like, he just knows, like, in that (laughs) moment that, like, this is just like the Homer Simpson car of sets, basically. Like, there's just too much going on. There wasn't enough of an editing process. There was, like, too much ideas, but not enough, like, effort to cultivate those ideas into, like, a a, a workable finished product. But the Massive Ghouls was Matt's, like... And he talked about that a lot with the stuff that we're working on. Like, make sure that whatever the top-level, like, design goal is, is something that comes through 
just by reading the commons and uncommons, even if you don't play the game that much. Like it should be communicated to everyone. And him just talking about the mass, the person holding up the massive ghouls and not knowing why they had a weird frame, and that being like, oh my god, we like we missed by so much in terms of communicating the stuff that was going on here to players who are not super invested. That story is a very good one because I obviously I was at my most invested during this time. So none of that stuff like was something of my thought process then, like it is now, you know, to third, yeah, third, well, almost 14 years later. But yeah, now it's just kind of like, whoa, what the hell guys? Like you guys are trying to do way too much in this set. Uh, and that's a nice transition to the final cycle that I'm going to talk about here, which is, of course, is the non-creature morphs. <laughs> well, I mean, this was with damage on the stack. So it's kind of leaning into the fact that you could stack damage and then turn this into a different card type for which damage no longer applied. So it was like a mechanical expression of something. Let's see if you remember these. Mm -hmm. Zoetic Cavern. Tapper, Colorless, or Bang. Your choice. <laughs> <laughs> Lumen Thread Field. No idea. Oh, yeah. See, this one was a good one. I'm going to Google it really quick. I'm pretty sure it's. It, I'm pretty sure it turns into an O one in. I'm pretty sure it turns into an enchantment that gives all your creatures plus O plus one. It is obviously morph cost three. Yep. Uh, well, excuse me. Three is a morph. Morph cost is one and a white. It turns into an enchantment. Creatures you control get plus O plus one. Hell yeah! So stack damage, save all my creatures potentially. And then wet wheel. You you don't know that one, do you? I have no clue. Yeah. No clue. So this was a four mana artifact. You could play it as a morph. Uh, and then you could unmorph it for three colorless. And it's XX tap. Target player puts the, uh, puts the top X cards of their library into their graveyard. Okay. I don't know why that's fun as a morph, but sure. I have no idea why either. Yeah. At least the land um, is like, you know, I, I can kind of get it. This was very much an example of, hey, we want to do all the things, so we're just going to do kind of all the things. Some cards I haven't even gotten to yet because I'm saving for the award show. But, I mean, th these cycles, you know, the Maguses, I think these are the worst cycle of Magus, Magus cards because they're extremely unfun a lot of the time. Like Magus of the Moat, Magus of the Abyss, Magus of the Moon. The pack cycle is like, ah, shit, I lost sometimes. Um, the Grandeur cycle, fine. The Future Shifted Dual Lands, some hits, some misses, auger cycle, whatever. But this set is noticeably weak for cycles, in my opinion, because there's just too much going on. Well, once you commit to we're going to make 60 cards that have their own keyword and that we don't show those keywords a second time, that's going to cut into your space to make cycles. Like, that's a lot of room in the file. It's like a third of it. Yeah. So yeah, it's I just can, really hard to, 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 it's hard to fill out from there. Well, that's our cycles. We're not going to grade them because we're going to move on to our award show because we're almost two hours into this thing and we don't want to take up that much more of your time. So short break, and then the real fun begins. Taking a quick break from the pod to let you know that if you are looking to sell your Magic the Gathering cards, it's never been easier over at StarCityGames.com. And with a 30% store credit bonus and the fastest turnaround time in the industry, why would you go anywhere else? You can use our buy list function. You can do a little ship plus sell. You can come to us, or heck, if your collection's big, we can come to you. StarCityGames.com slash sell is where you're going to want to head for more information. One more time, that's StarCityGames.com slash sell, S-E-L-L, -L, for more information. And now, back to the pod. All right, let's just dive into it, folks. It's awards time here on the Future Side episode of The Receivables. We're going to kick things off, as we always do, with the Oko Thief of Crowns Award for best card in the set. Our options are the following, Patrick. Of course, this provided by one Nick Mella. Tarmogoyf, Bridge from Below, Street Wraith, Magus of the Moon, Summoner's Pact, Sword of the Meek. Summoner's Pact. Ooh. And I think my second place vote would not was not on the list. Which is? Horizon Canopy. 
it's harder now because that's our modern horizons. It's like, well, there's six of them. So the value of over replacement isn't as high as it used to be. But prior to that, I, I think horizon canopy probably would have gotten my vote. So your answer is not Tarmoglyph. It's not. It's just like, there's just a lot of things like Tarmoglyph out there. <laughs> you can get a lot of Tarmoglyphs. So this is tough because I like we were going with Horizon Canopy, which was not listed. I like we were going with Summoner's Pact. I think you could make an argument for even Talera West if you wanted to, but I don't think yep, it's a strong that would argument. be on my short list too. That would be on my short list as well. And Absolutely. I also think, I think Bridge from Below comes in ahead of Tarmoglyph as well. Because right, even, I just, the card's sorry, weird, but like it is extremely powerful. On these lists, I put a high, a high premium on value over replacement. Okay. Like, you can just find Tarmogoyf's good. There's a lot of standard formats where it wouldn't even be that impressive just because like filling up your graveyard isn't that easy all the time. And in eternal formats, it's like it's a two drop that attacks or blocks. Like you could just there's just it's just, it's just a dime a dozen thing. Tarmogoyf might be better than many of the other options or even all the other options some amount of the time. But that to me just doesn't compare to something like Summoner's Pack, which is just like its own dimension, super powerful, has shown up in a bunch of really powerful decks across all formats. Um, yeah, so it's 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 hard for me to vote for Tarmogoyf over that, even if Tarmogoyf has like shown up in more competitive deck lists than Summer's Pack has. Now, to be fair, Tarmogoyf, I think you're underselling a little bit because it was the two drop during yeah, this yeah. time. Definitely. Yeah, it, it had its moment in the sun for sure. And it's still really good. Like, I play modern leagues all the time, and like a lot of my opponents have Tarmogoyf. It has stood up in the test of time, but it's just, you know, like I said, I, I put a, a, a lot of value over value over replacement, and Tarmogoyf just doesn't grade very highly through that lens. All right, we're moving on. I'm going to give it to. Uh... Wait, what am I going to give it to? So you're giving it the Summoner's Pack? I am. I'm going to give it to Horizon Canopy. Yeah. I, I like that choice a lot, too. All right. Carnival of Souls Award for worst card in the set. Not as many nominees as you would think. We're going to start things off with Baron Glory. I I like that point you just made. This set is busted. So many hits in this set. Yeah, there's a lot of good cards. This is not that many weak ones, either. Like, almost everything has a purpose. Four white, white enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control... No permanents other than Baron Glory and have no cards in hand, you win the game. Tough one to pull off. <laughs> Force of Savagery. 2G. Oh, God. 8-0. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, you cast it and it dies is pretty bad. No, no. You don't think that's good? No, it's just not that, it's just not that strong, you know? Because when you cast it, it just instantly dies. Oh, okay. <laughs> but at least it's got a cool frame. Uh, Mystic Speculation. Don't know that one. Googling. People can hear me typing. They're going to hear me cough. <coughs> My body's giving out, kids. We're almost there, though. We've almost made it. <laughs> uh, blue Sorcery. Buyback 2. Scry 3. Oh, this thing. Yeah, this thing. Yeah. That's all it does. Doesn't draw a card. Uh, and then Nick Miller has also Bridge from Below, somehow possibly the best and worst card when in play in the set. Uh, it, my, is, go ahead. it is shocking that that card has a mana cost. I've cast it before. To what end? Just like sacrificing it to something? Needed to blow it up with Nature's Claim, gain four life. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really rough to have a card with a mana cost and then no text box when it's in play. Even if sometimes it's a permanent and then it has value. My vote here is for uh, Force of Savagery, because when you cast it, it dies and doesn't do anything. And even the times where it does do something because you've played an Anthem in front of it, it's not that good. No, it's, it's, it's a horrible card. Yeah. 8-0 Tramp Elemental. This is, this, is the, this is the card, more so than Char Rumbler, of the look how cute we are. And it's like, I know. It's like this card, if it sees play... It's going to be in, like, combo decks that have, like, Pandemonium involved or something. And it's like, this card showing up is up to literally no good. It's not even an interesting thought experiment about how to make it work. It's just like, this is just stupid. Well, it's even worse than that, I think. Because you look at Char Rumbler, 
And it's like, okay, this is a little, like, weird and confusing, but, like, whatever. I, I could just, like, kind of set that aside and not care about it. Force of Savagery is really appealing in some respects. Like, it's eight power trampler for three mana. You just don't see that. And a regular person would just not believe that the designers made a card that just dies when you cast it. They just assume that, like, there's got to be some... There's some rule I don't understand. Like, there's no way the... What actually happens here is that it just it just dies when you cast it, but that is actually how it works. That's exactly how it works, yeah. Uh, Doomblade Award for Best Role Player in the set. Here we go. A lot of options. Pack Negation. So this is fun also because a lot of these cards we haven't even talked about yet. Pack Negation, Teleria West, Dryad Arbor, Glittering Wish, Yixla Jailer, Slaughter Pact, Narcamoeba, Venser Shaper Savant, Daybreak Coronet, even Mind Sensor. I would give it to Dryad Arbor. In, really? It, for two reasons. One is, it's just shown up all the all over the place in a variety of decks, in a variety of formats, for a variety of roles. Like, it's just like, it, it's, a, it's a weirdo, and, and it's powerful, so it just fills in a lot of gaps that other cards can't. And then it's also extremely future sighty. Like, it's just a land, but it's also a creature. And it just doesn't tap for mana on the first turn because it's summoning sick. And it's a forest for whatever reason. Like, it's just a really weird, weird, weird card. Um, so, yeah, that's my vote. My vote's Teleria West. A fine choice. A lot yeah. of good role players in this set. There are. Because it's really just are. really powerful. Really powerful set with no cycles. And so it's just like, there's just a bunch of random good stuff in here. And it still shows up in like modern and legacy years and years later. Next up, a Boro Palace of the Clouds, fun of one of in the set. I'm going to disqualify Tombstalker and Venser right now. I'm going to bring it down to these other two cards. Pack Navigation and Dryad Arbor. Uh, Dryad Arbor. Pack Navigation, Actually. when it shows up, is often more than one copy. Yeah, I mean, like, Amulet Bloom sometimes has one, but they sideboard into others. Dryad Arbor, you're starting to see two of in green decks sometimes, but for the most part, I think it's Dryad Arbor is a one of. Uh, and I think the I think this is a runaway Dryad Arbor. Yeah, I think so, too. Earl the Mistalker award for that card's from this set, which we're almost to Earl, which I'm excited about. Uh, Sword of the Meek, Coalition Relic, Sliver Legion, Pyromancer's Swath. Coalition Relic. That was a huge printing for Block Constructed, Ben. It is a normal card that is really appealing. <laughs> the set has none of those. <laughs> it's like a, it's just like a cool, sweet one of design. My my winner for this award is Pyromancer Swath because I forgot that card existed. Sure, that's fair. do you do you know what that card does? It's like the storm and buyback and uh kicker. It's like that like constellation of stuff on one card. Is that right? No. <laughs> what am I thinking of? I don't know. There's like the plus one plus O oh when it's got like storm and buyback or something. Oh, you're thinking of Haze of Rage. Haze of Rage. Okay. Swath is two and a red enchantment. If an instant or sorcery Source you control will deal damage to a creature or player. It deals that much damage, plus two. And at mm -hmm. the end of turn, discard your hand. Okay. Just, so it's it like was how recycle, it, sort of. It was, the way this, it was the way that Storm decks won. Yeah. They would go off, cast this, and Grape Shot you and kill you. Uh, here we go. Char Rumbler Award for weirdest card in the set. Now, we could argue that Char Rumbler should just win, given the name of the award. But we have... Quite a few nominees. Yeah. I don't think Char Rumbler is going to get it. I don't think it is either. There's Char Rumbler. There's Force of Savagery. Ah, Spellweaver Volute. There it is. Old Faithful. What's it do, you ask? Three blue blue. Enchantment Aura. Enchant instant card in a graveyard. Whenever you cast a sorcery spell, copy the enchanted instant card. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. If you do, exile the enchanted card and attach, and attach Spellweaver Volute to another instant card in a graveyard. 
Yeah, Impure- uh, in- Go ahead. Enchant- Go ahead. Yeah, I know. Just enchanting spells in your graveyard is a little weird. Keep going. Imperial Mask. Four and a white. Enchantment. When Imperial Mask enters the battlefield, if it's not a token... <laughs> Each, what else would what else would it be? Uh, each of your teammates <laughs> what, what, you, what, what you got going? <laughs> each of your teammates creates a token that's a copy of Imperial Mass. Where, where'd you go? <laughs> Did your mic cut out? Did your mic cut out just now? My favorite part of this card, oh my god. If it's not a token, why would it be? Uh, each of your teammates, what? <laughs> what? Creates a token that's a copy of Imperial Mask. You have Hexproof. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Uh, let's see what else does Dick have on the list here. Bridge from Below, we've covered. Arcanum Wings, we've covered. Darksteel Garrison, we've covered. Nyx? This is yeah. Nyx is come on. Nyx is single blue counter target spell if no mana was paid uh no mana was spent to play it. Mm-hmm. Uh Lucent Lim- L- Limit Limited? What the hell? This is the enchantment creature. I already know that. <laughs> I don't know what a limited is. Uh three white white flying enchantment creature enchantment which looks weird then but because they did bestow it doesn't look as weird now and then emblem of the war mind now even i don't know what this is hold on i know most cards okay red okay so one in a red aura enchant creature you control creatures you control have haste okay uh what's your winner the Volute. <laughs> Dude, I think my winner is is Imperial Mask. Sure, fine choice. The, the, listen, there are no wrong choices on this list. And there's like 20 cards that we just went through. But yeah, I, I'm going to give it to the, the Volute. Just enchanting, enchanting cards in your graveyard is just like, it's just nonsense. It's in not, any, grave, like, any, gra- any graveyard. It's just not how the rules of the game are written. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, a card from a different game. Let's go to Question Beast Award for a novel on a card. Mm-hmm. The Volute is back. Yep. Uh, Nakata War Pride. Uh huh. I'm going to Google this one really quick. A fine I remember, choice. I remember there being a lot going on with this card. All right, so 3GGG. Nakata War Pride must be blocked by exactly one creature available. When Nakata War Pride attacks, create X tokens that are copies of Nakata War Pride. That are tapped and attacking, where X is the number of creatures defending player controls. Exile the tokens at the beginning of the XN step. So basically, when it attacks, it makes a copy for each creature the opponent controls, and it has to be blocked. Okay? Uh, yeah. Gibbering Descent. I can see the picture. I don't know the text box. Uh, four BB. So six mana black enchantment. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player loses a life and discards a card. Hellbent, skip your upkeep step if you have no cards in hand. Madness 2BB. <laughs> That's a lot. Okay. That's a lot. Uh, Shapeshifter's Morrow. Don't know this card. All right, two, two blue blue, four mana enchantment. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, that player reveals the top card of their library. If it's a creature card... The player puts it puts the card in their graveyard, and Shapeshifter's Morrow becomes a copy of that card. Okay, that's actually kind of sweet. Okay. Wait, what? That player puts the top card. If it's a creature card, the player puts the top card in their graveyard. Why is that? Oh, oh, okay, okay, never mind. So if they have a big creature, I mill it, and then my thing becomes that. Okay. Yeah, it's like a clone, but not really. But, okay, it, t- it took me a second. Yeah, that card's that's that's kind of cool. Shimmy Inspector. Two BB. Two two flyer. When Shimmy Inspector deals combat damage to a player, that player reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. 
search that player's graveyard, hand, library, and and exile the cards with that name. Then that player shuffles their library. So basically, I hit you, I take a card, and I cranial extraction you. Cool. All right, what you got? Hmm. It's a tough answer. No, it's not. What's yours? The Volute. You're voluting again? I'm bringing the Volute back. Well, I mean, this is my first award the Volute's won. Yeah. I think it's a fine choice. Okay. It is nonsense and long, so short. <laughs> uh, Pack Rat Award for Best Limited Card in the Set. Sprout Swarm. Oris, Samite Guardian. Acromas Memorial. Molten Disaster. I mean, I don't know if there's how many commons there are in draft history that are better than Sprout Swarm. And it's also got some real pack rat vibes to it, too. <laughs> so originally, when Nick sent this over, the notes, the only thing that he had underneath the award was, was Sprout Swarm. And I was like, come on, there's got to be better cards, right? With this set, I actually think mm-hmm. it might be Sprout Swarm. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of any of the rares that were like, even close. A lot of the rare creatures were just like, hey, it's a f- like Terox Bladewing. Five mana, four, three haste flyer, GL. And it's like, I don't know, kill it. Yeah, I mean, that, that card's totally fine. It's just not as good as the Sprout Swarm. Yeah. Sprout Swarm is literally like, you can't attack on the ground and now you're dead. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then you're going to die. Answer. You're going to die very soon. Yeah. So, and my all you answer, need to do is like, play lands. Swarm. Yeah, pretty, I mean, yeah, yeah play lands and just that, do that every turn, your opponent's dead. Yeah, right. Sprout Swarm. Also unbeatable in 2HG if memory serves. Extremely unbeatable. Yeah. No one was touching you. Yeah. Uh, blank award for best card name in this set. There's a lot of options. I'm just going to give you three. E- even the odds, Steam Flogger Boss, Molten Disaster. I don't know. I love the name Teleria West. Yeah? Love that name. Is there a Teleria East? No, but it implies that there is. Like, it makes the world... So, first of all, it's kind of like this... It's kind of like this fancy feature site card, right? It's like a land with transmute. It's, like, complicated and also feels like you're playing with fire a little bit. And it's also actually good. Like, so that's all great. And it makes it seem like... I don't know that that world's really big. And the ability to, like, tutor or do something subversive is only a small element of the world. I don't... I, I think that name is, like, really sweet. All right, I won't fight you on it. I'm going to give it to Steam Flogger Boss on my end. Which is cool. I mean, that is a that is a cool name. John Avon Award for Best Land Artwork in the Set. Nimbus Maze, River of Tears, Horizon Canopy, Teleria West. Horizon Canopy. Future Sight Foil Horizon Canopy is one of the sickest looking foils in the game. They're pretty sexy, huh? Yeah, they look yeah. awesome. I like River of Tears a lot, so I'm gonna go with that. But I can't fight you on a Rising Canopy. That's a really good choice. The, the that that cycle of lands has like really great art, really great art. I think Aurelius Fury Award for most overhyped card during previous season. Couple of cards we didn't touch on: Glittering Wish, mm-hmm. Pack Navigation, mm-hmm. Delay. Mm-hmm. which I forgot was in this set. And my winner, Heartwood Storyteller. It's a really good choice. How is Control going to beat this thing? Yeah, it's like, I don't know, very easily. Uh, they're going to kill it and then kill you? Or right. not even yeah, care? I think it, yeah, Storyteller is a really good choice. It's either that or Delay. I think people uh, Heart- thought Delay was going to be a a big hitter, and it was just not a card. It was just not very good at all. Heartwood Storyteller, for the record, was 1 GG, 2 3 Tree Folk. When a player plays a non creature spell, each of that player's opponents may draw a card. So it's like, yeah, I cast this against control, and they play all uh, non creature spells. So I'm just going to draw the cards and kill you. And it's like, that's never how the game played. Never how it worked. No. It doesn't work that way. No. And I have a new award, my friend, to close us out. It is the Tarmogoyf Award for most underhyped card during preview season. Because you mentioned your experience with Tarmogoyf and speculating on that and being correct. I have a similar story. Uh, This is when I was dropped out of school. 
I'm 100% mm-hmm. sure I was dropped out of school this time because uh, my, my good friend in Ohio, Justin George, was driving me to the local store that was like 40 minutes away because I didn't have a car. I think I had my license at this point, but didn't have a car. And we would go play every Tuesday at a place in uh, Ohio, in, in uh, Oberlin, Ohio, called Matrix Games. And Justin, like you, had speculated on Tarmogoyfs, and so he had like 16 of them. And mm-hmm. this is when Zoo was picking up a little bit in popularity. In Standard, people are like, hey, there's a Zoo deck because his Tarmogoyf card's good. And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it, it's probably not that good. And I remember playing it in a tournament. And I like cast it on turn two, and then on turn three it was like a four or five, and I was like, "Oh my god, yeah, what the hell is this thing?" And I remember looking at the deck list, and it's like, "Yeah, there's a couple copies of like Seal of Fire, some other stuff going on," and it's just like, well, "That's like kind of weird or whatever." And then like once you see all the pieces in play come together, and it's like, "Oh cool, it's just a two mana five six. It's like, "Oh Jesus!" Yeah, people didn't know. It took and a while no for one, people to catch on. No one was talking about this card at all. During preview season, and then every, and then people realize it's just like, oh, it's just two mana four five or two mana five six. It's just completely busted. And then, yeah. of course, the stories from there tell themselves with everything at you know modern modern. What are those sets? Horizons. Those, is it Horizons? Modern Horizons or mod, Modern Masters? Modern Masters. Masters. Like, and the you know, the cost of Tarmac Wife is like two hundred dollars and all this other stuff. And so we know the history of Tarmac Wife now, but we actually had the opportunity to live it during that time. And it's just like, yeah, this card was. Two dollars for a long time. Yeah, I think I actually think people would have caught on faster if the card didn't say Planeswalker on it. But because that card said Planeswalker on it, that's all that people talked about. Not actually is this card good in a tournament setting, but just like what's a Planeswalker or is this a joke? Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be a new award going forward, which is the most underhyped card during previous season that clearly overperformed. Uh, and oddly enough, I think when we do get to Throne of Eldraine, I think Oko might win that award. Possibly, yeah. People were, I mean, some people knew, but n- no one, like, really, like, knew, knew how bad it was going to be. No one saw that card when it was printed and just went, holy shit, this is a huge error. Kind of. I mean, Sam Black was way on top of it. Sam Black was on it, but not to the degree that we've seen like other cards. Like I remember when they when they released Once Upon a Time and everyone's like, uh <laughs> Right. I remember that. Same. We didn't have we didn't have that thought when Oko got uh unveiled, I think. Well Sam I think Sam did call it like potentially best planeswalker of all time during previous season season. So he did. He was that far out of it. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think all anyone right, was saying it. like banned in all formats was the was being the prediction. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's close her down. Uh, okay. What card won? What card won the set? Tarmogoyf. Weird frame, calls out a new card type, so it's like very future sighty, and like iconic, powerful card still shows up all over the place. I don't want to agree, but I'm gonna. I know it's it kinda, it's not the it's not the flashiest answer, but that card's just got quite the resume and has elements of it that makes it feel like a future site card. All right. Now, more importantly, <laughs> what grade do you give the set? I know this is a little bit of a cop out, but like my, my grades almost like an NA. Like I, I just don't see future site as being a set in a way that we talk about sets. Like it is, it's, it almost feels like closer to like a secret layer product than a like set as we understand them. And so I think, like, once the conceit is you're doing something so different and so unlikely to be repeated, um, that analyzing it as a as a set feels like almost inappropriate. So I I can't even really give it a grade. I give this set a D. Okay, I'm gonna tell you why. This set is trying to do too much, and I have a real disdain for places that try to do too much. And don't K I S S. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. To me, there's a big difference between Chipotle and Qdoba. Like a re- even though they basically sell the same product, if you think of Chipotle, they just have had the same shit on their menu for the most part for like their 25, 30 years in existence, right? You go in there, it's real simple. 
You start here. You want rice, like you want a burrito, you want tacos, hard or soft. Okay. You know, you want rice, you want beans, cheese, salsas, what kind of protein, whatever. Over time, you know, they've added tofu and they, they finally added queso, all this other stuff. And the Kudoba, they came in and they're like, yo, we got burritos, we got nachos, we got quesadillas, we got three types of queso, we got eight different types of salsa, vinaigrettes, all this shit, right? I don't need all that. I'm trying to do too yeah. much. Yeah. Just like, give me a handful of things that I like. Chipotle is just, and, and what I always find really interesting about this, because I come from a restaurant background and marketing all this other stuff, is like, it's not like Chipotle didn't know they couldn't do all these things that Qdoba is doing. Right? It's like, oh, okay, so interesting. We never thought of that. You know, it's like, yeah, we could. We're just not. You know, we're like, we could do nachos, we could do quesadillas and a bunch of other shit. We're just not doing that. We're just keeping it real simple for, like, our business model, our employees, our costs, like, all this other stuff, which is one reason, like, Chipotle is obviously not perfect, but, like, it's a reason I really like Chipotle is because, like, we know who we are, and we know what we want to be, and we know who we cater towards, and so, like, we don't have to have all these bells and whistles and all this extra shit. It's why the Cheesecake Factory drives me nuts. Uh, and it's, is it all, there's like 70 items. None of them are edible and it's $18. I mean, it's like $25, but yes. Sure. Yeah. And also they give you a metric ton of it. And like all of it is C, C, C plus B minus at best. You're not, you're never leaving. You're never leaving cheesecake factory and thinking that was an A. It's not possible. No, no. I think and, uh, yeah, I think it's fine to say, like, yeah, there's just too much going on here. It's befuddling and just, like, great at low. But, yeah, it's just, like, a... Th- this, is to me, is, like, just an entirely different experience, like I said. It, it's just, it's just like, yeah, it's an entirely different experience. It's like, it's like this indulging for the sake of indulging. And it's just, like, that's a... Like, that's just... That's, like, it's just too much. And this is, again, when I was my most checked in. And so, like, I didn't care about any of that stuff. It's just, like, hey, what are the best cards for the next tournament I'm playing in? But that example that you gave me about the Matt Place thing is so salient because it's just like, hey, I play Magic like once every, you know, like, I don't know, like once, once a week, once every two weeks. And it's like, oh, cool, new set's coming out. And like you open a booster pack and you're just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Right? If you're a player who's not that engaged, it's just like you got massive ghouls staring at me, got a future side border, got steam, steam, like steam flicker boss with the right riggers and contraptions. It's like, what, what are those? Oh, don't worry about it. And it's like, don't worry what? about it. Yeah, what's a what's a what's a rigor? That's not a real thing. Oh, I got a thing with negative power. Oh, I got a thing with zero toughness. It just dies if you cast it. Like, yeah, it's there's just a lot of just bewildering stuff going on. Yeah, so for me, it's just like this set. It, it feels very Cheesecake Factory, very Taco Bell with their quesadilla chup- chalupa gordito burrito or whatever. It just everybody just settled down. So it it totally misses for me. It's fun to talk about, but it's a total, it's not an F like cold snap, but this is a total whiff for me. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of ideas, but they're not uh, collected and then edited into something that's like a cohesive thought. Also just, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, the idea that like, and I mentioned this much earlier in the podcast, like I was able to keep up with all of these abilities and all these keywords because I was just playing magic so much. But it's like the idea that like, uh, not even like a low level player, but like a mid level player is like, what's frenzy. I don't know. What's fortification. I don't like, I, I don't know. I don't know what all these abilities are. This is really hard to keep up with. Like, I don't know if that pushes people out of the game and I'm really, I'm really hoping that it doesn't, but like when it's that overwhelming, it's kind of like, I don't know. I want to play something that's simpler. Yeah. I don't think anyone like, I think it's really infrequent that someone's like, oh, there's too many keywords here and that's why I'm quitting. But it is like you're not having a good time and then you decide to do something else with your time and money. And that is reflected in part by like how intuitive and like, are you focusing on things that are fun? It's a big part of it. Like memorizing how 60 keywords work is not that much fun. Playing the game where you're like attacking and blocking and making decisions and playing around stuff is like really fun. And how much of the experience with Future Sight is literally just the memorization of what's going on versus the stuff that's actually fun. Like, it definitely tips the scales more towards the first thing than I, probably any Magic set does. So, with that, Future Sight is done. I'm going to close things out with a question for the audience. 
Patrick and I have not decided where we're going to go next in this podcast. We got to Future Sight. We didn't know if it was going to be one or two episodes. Just one episode, as you've all listened to and hopefully have enjoyed. So we can go backwards, which means we could go to like, let's see, where did we start? We started with Mirrodin Block. So we could go backwards to... Uh, the Dark. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, just as an example, the dark. <laughs> we could we could go to onslaught, uh, legion scourge OLS. We could do mass nemesis prophecy, invasion plane shift apocalypse saga block, which I'm sure you have a lot to talk about there. I do. We could go forward. We could go to Kaladesh, Aether Revolt. Uh, we could go to. Theros, Born of the Gods, Journey into Nyx. We could do Zendikar, World Wake, Rise of the Eldrazi. A lot of ways we can go, obviously. We can, hell, we could actually start with, I don't know how much I have to say about this, but you might. Alpha, Beta, Unlimited. I could talk for I, easily 24 hours on that set. So. Okay, I bring nothing to the table with that. Okay. Maybe more than I think, but I, I, right now, I feel like I bring nothing to the table. So this is your opportunity to tweet at me, at Cedric A. Phillips. Don't tweet at Patrick. He's not even going to bother. This is your chance to leave your comments on the YouTube video of this podcast and tell us where do you want us to go next? And then we will take that into account moving forward from next week's episode. With that, I'm going to go lay down because I feel like total shit. Be well, everyone. Mm -hmm.